Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we'll be delving into more true and terrifying tales. Before we get started, though, if you have a true scary story that you would like to share, go to ravenreadshorror.com forward slash pages forward slash story, and you can submit your story there. You can also check out the shop while you're there. The other shop I have is SpookyLovely.com, which is the apparel and Teespring shop. I'm updating the designs there pretty much all the time, so keep checking it out to see if there's something you might like. As always, links to Patreon and anything you might need, including the other channels and podcasts, are always in the description below. But without further ado, you know what time it is. It's time to get comfortable. Grab a beverage of choice and get ready to take another journey into the night. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service, besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21-year-old female in my second year of nursing, and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two-bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park, and at night, when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime, but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs, and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 p.m. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods, until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was 
pretty peaceful and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter because it was light enough to see the sky and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine, until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was, until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground, heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double-checking the doors and windows when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step, 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on, or what this thing is, and can tell me what I can do, let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. I was just thinking of an experience I had one weekend this past summer. I've had many extremely dark paranormal experiences, but this wasn't one of them. It was still emotionally intense and profound in its own way though. I was at an outdoor music festival in Virginia in the United States. It was on an old farm. The property was huge, with big rolling fields and a few various small buildings littered about. After that evening's show got called off due to threatening electrical storms and crazy strong wind, I started walking across a field toward a little old shack set back among a few trees. The setting was surreal, like out of a movie. The sky was swirling and churning with dark gray-black clouds. The wind was strong, but felt very refreshing after a hot, sunny, sweaty day. The electricity in the air was palpable. Everything felt slightly charged. As I started walking into the middle of the field, suddenly everybody was gone. I couldn't see or hear a single person from the festival. I kept walking across the field to the shack and I was feeling very heavy emotionally. There was a definite presence, not malevolent, but heavy. When I got to the shack, I collapsed on my knees and I began weeping and apologizing repeatedly. 
This went on probably for a few minutes, but it felt like it was happening outside of time. It felt to me at this point like I was addressing formerly enslaved people who had lived and worked on the property. It was like they were all around me. Eventually I stood up. I felt pleasantly exhausted after a big emotional release. I still hadn't seen or heard anyone from the festival since I had first walked away from them. I began walking back slowly toward the field where my car was and the rain started pouring down. I soaked it all in as I walked back to my car. That night, after it became clear that the storm was going to prevent any further music from happening, I drove back to my motel room in heavy rain. I was awake in bed at 3 a.m. or so, when I heard a creaking noise that turned out to be the mini fridge door slowly opening. I got up to check it out. I thought maybe the magnet on the mini fridge was weak, but it wasn't. It was very strong. There was no way this thing opened on its own. So I knew that something was there with me. I wasn't quite confident yet in my ability to assess the situation accurately on the spot. So I was feeling a bit leery and self-protective. But as some time went by, I grew more relaxed and I sensed that the spirit was not malevolent. I sensed that she was a female spirit of a formerly enslaved person who had followed me back to my motel room. The energy in the room wasn't dark or ominous. It was like a mixture of sorrow, exhaustion, curiosity, and relief. I looked up the history of the property that the festival was being held at, and I confirmed that the property had been home to many enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. I found myself wishing that I had been more comforting and explicitly accepting of her during those first few hours. I hope she was able to pass on after our encounter. In a way, I feel like she followed me back from the farm before she chose to pass on because I was a curiosity to her, or maybe because I had shown kindness. Something that makes this experience stand out to me is that I rarely encounter human spirits like this. Mostly, I only encounter human spirits remotely through other people. My immediate radius is always so full of other non-human entities that I think most human spirits just steer clear but there are a few things about the way this encounter unfolded that I think allowed for it to happen as it did. I had driven 12 hours to get there on the previous day, so there wasn't the usual residual dark energy just hanging around from the get-go. I also feel like the intense swirling electrical wind and rainstorms that surrounded the festival for multiple days created a unique situation energetically. Either way, it was an emotional experience and it felt cleansing. I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man. So I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time my father and I found him in his rocking chair, with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things, doors opening that shouldn't be, unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time, I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me. Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots 
like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold. I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different, almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night, stupid, I know, and I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks really, but nothing happened. In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better and they were for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. This story was posted to r slash paranormal by user accomplished work 454. When he and his friends were playing in a forest nearby their home as kids, they encountered something that they're unlikely to forget anytime soon. Here's the story. I'm from Ohio in the United States. When I was in the fourth grade, 10 years old, I'm 19 now, my buddies and I were out in the woods behind my buddy's house. We were always back there growing up. There was a creek that we would hop over and just on the other side was a farm with some horses. One day, we had just jumped over the creek 
but were still in the woods right by it. That's when we heard what sounded like a little girl's scream at the top of her lungs. Being young kids, we all just froze, thinking it was odd to hear such a vibrant scream in the middle of the day. About five to seconds later, right in front of us, a black figure zoomed across some bushes and shrubs at lightning speed. We all looked at each other and bolted out of the woods to my buddy's house. We were all in shock about what we had seen, and to this day we still talk about how creepy it was. It moved so fast that there's no way it could have been human. And where I live, the only wild animals we have are white-tailed deer, coyotes, and foxes. This thing was at least six to seven feet tall and was black enough to look like a shadow or something. It didn't look like it was absorbing any light at all or that it was absorbing so much that it was the darkest black I've ever seen. I'm curious if anyone else in Ohio or the United States for that matter has ever seen anything similar. I live right by the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, so maybe there've been some sightings there even though this wasn't in the national park, just a small patch of woods in a pretty suburban area. Our next story was posted to r slash paranormal by accomplished row 520. She tells the tale of what happened when she met a strange mourner at her great aunt's funeral. Here's the story. Years ago, when my great aunt passed, at her funeral, there was this old man. He was wearing a suit and he had a neck tattoo of an octopus. He had long hair and a ponytail. He kind of looked a little bit like Jack Welker from Breaking Bad. He started talking to me about my grandma and told me to take care of her and grandpa for a few minutes. Then gave me a dollar and asked me nicely to go to the vending machine and get him a water because he came to pay his respects and he had to keep going. He even knew my name, but I had never met him before and I hadn't given it to him. When I came back to give him the water bottle, I couldn't find him. I looked everywhere and I even asked my grandparents if they had seen an older man around anywhere and I described what he looked like. When we got home, my grandparents came over and they were looking at family photo albums and they saw the man that I described, the one that asked for a water, in the pictures. They yelled at me to come downstairs and showed me the picture and pointed to him. They asked if it was the man I had seen and I said it was. He looked exactly the same. They told me that it was my great aunt's ex-husband, Robert, who had been dead for 20 years. That's how he knew my name. He had died well before I was born. And like I said, I wasn't that close with my great aunt, so I hadn't ever really heard about him. Either way, Robert had been dead for over 20 years. I didn't sleep for at least a week, maybe more. God, the faces they made still send shivers down my spine. It was like they were watching somebody get killed in front of them when they heard about what happened to me and realized who it had been. They told me he was a good person and he and my great aunt regularly attended church and were just overall good people. I would say that I'm kind of religious, but I don't know. So, more than likely, he wasn't up to anything evil, I guess. I suppose he asked for the water so I would go away and he could disappear. He really loved his wife. I guess when he said he had to move on, it's because he had to take her to the next life or something. They asked me if I spent the dollar, and I said I did. I kind of wonder what would have happened if I had kept it, or what happened to whoever wound up with it. Either way, it was a very unsettling and strange experience, if not kind of sweet. Our 
Our next tale comes to us from Reddit user Throwing Away 1999. The author recounts a horrifying experience from a road trip they went on with their mom. Here's what they wrote. I'll do my best to explain what I saw, but it's difficult to paint an exact picture. I was driving across the country with my mom. We had just entered California from Arizona a little before 11 p.m. It was a rural area, and there were other cars around, but I definitely wouldn't call it traffic. I'm driving, and a bit off the road, on the right side, at ground level, I see something glowing. It's a fluorescent, neon, but dark blue. Very bright, but it didn't light up anything around it. It was just glowing. It was shaped like some kind of energy cell looking thing out of a futuristic movie or video game. Probably five feet tall and two feet wide, with ribbed sides. I then realized that this thing was moving, and moving very weirdly. It was moving like it was glued to the ground and tracing the slightly hilly terrain, like it was on top of some kind of off-roading vehicle that was magnetically held down to the terrain that it was driving on. After a few seconds, it goes up a little, and then it disappears into the ground. Then we see these two small spotlights pointing from the air down to where it disappeared. They were moving really quickly, like the ones that you see when there's some kind of event in an arena in your city. But the light didn't reach up super far. These spotlights were encased by some kind of light dome and couldn't shine past it. The light was just stopped in its tracks instead of fading out into the sky. The dome was all lit up. It looked like there was fog inside of it, but not exactly fog. I could still see these two spotlights shining around in it, sporadically, because they were shining brighter than the rest of the dome. Keep in mind that I could not see anything else, as it was really dark. I couldn't see the ground or the surroundings. I drove past it, speaking with my mom, trying to figure out what the heck we had just seen. All of it looked so extremely unnatural. Literally five seconds of driving later, my mom screams, What's that? I never ended up seeing what she was talking about, but she described basically what the internet says are stickmen on the left side of the road. It was the opposite side of the road from where we'd seen the neon light dome thing, and about five seconds of doing about 65 miles per hour as far as distance from the dome. She said they were about 12 feet tall, built like stick figures, or on stilts, and she couldn't discern a head. I saw another post somewhere that described how they walked in the same way my mom had said, like lolloping, or had kind of a bounce or waddle in their steps. At first, there was only one walking, then another appeared close to it, and they were going toward each other. I punched the gas and got out of there, because screw that. I didn't think quick enough to take a video of the light dome blue thing, but I'm glad I didn't, because for some reason, I feel like we wouldn't have gotten off that easy for having footage like that. I'm not sure why I can't shake the theory that this blue light has to do with the government or something, but I don't know anything. I'll also mention that we saw flashing things in the sky pretty far away, moving too close to each other to be a normal aircraft. I've written that off as Border Patrol drones, but mostly just to put myself at ease. The next story is the account of a Redditor who saw something very strange in a tree on their property. Here's the tale. At the time, my house was situated perpendicular to a wooded area. It was just a normal, lazy summer day. I stepped onto the porch to stretch my legs and get some fresh air. I glanced over toward the tree line and immediately noticed a black silhouette of what appeared to be a man. 
My eyes are deceiving me, or so I thought. Thirty feet in the canopy of an old oak tree, he sat. I was perplexed. At that height, the branches couldn't bear the weight of a squirrel. He was kneeling down, one arm above his head grasping the branch above him, as if to balance himself. Solid black, no defining features whatsoever. It was just a solid black mass, but no doubt it was a man. I was fixated. As I stared at him, I could tell that he was staring right back at me. I could feel it. We stared at each other for what seemed like an eternity. Then, suddenly, he stood up and started running, jumping from tree to tree. Eventually, my house obstructed my view, so I gave chase, but to no avail. As I rounded the corner, he was gone. I ran to the trees, but could see nothing except swaying branches on a calm summer afternoon with no wind. That was roughly 25 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I suppose you don't really forget an experience like that. I had never really given much thought to the paranormal or the otherworldly before that, or after really. It wasn't until about 10 years later, as I was flipping through the channels, that I stumbled across a documentary about shadow people, and I knew immediately that that's what I had witnessed so long ago. When Redditor OG Wiz was 15 years old, they lived in a basement apartment at their parents' house. What happened there stuck with them for the rest of their lives. Here's the story. My parents bought their house in 1996. The family that owned it before us renovated the basement to be an apartment complete with its own kitchen and bathroom. So obviously, at 15, I lived in the basement apartment. I stayed there until 2013. I had this TV stand that I used for storage space. It sat next to the bathroom door. It had a couple of old computers on it, some boxes of random junk, and a ton of DVD cases. They were all empty cases. I had separate storage for the discs themselves, but I had a thing about not letting go of useless items, apparently. In the living room, which I didn't really use much, there were a couple of old couches. The family cat preferred to hang out there on one of the couches. One night, probably around 11 p.m., I went to use the washroom. The cat was on the couch, and no one else was home. I opened the door to leave the bathroom, and suddenly a DVD case shot from the TV stand and hit the wall across the room. At the same moment, the cat jumped up, arched its back, and started hissing. Then the cat ran upstairs. That was the only time that this happened to me in that basement. And it's the only time that I ever saw that cat, who recently died at the age of 22, hiss or arch his back at anything. I've only had a few experiences in my life that I would consider paranormal. I don't really much believe in this stuff, to tell you the truth. But I could not figure out any other explanation for the DVD case flying across the room or for the cat to act so out of character. I don't know what it was, but I believe that something was there that night. Redditor Throwaway 1964 is a firefighter. What they encounter during one particular call has never left them. This is their story. I'm a firefighter and medic. I went to a house fire with one entrapped on the second floor once. Sounded like a lady screaming. We went up there and couldn't find her anywhere. 
Visibility in a fire is pretty awful, so finding people inside can be difficult. We spent about 20 minutes looking before a command ordered us to abandon the search. It was pretty disheartening because we knew somebody was there and we knew that we were basically leaving them to die. When we got out, we wanted to know why we were ordered to stop the search. And we were told it was because there was never anybody there in the first place. Everybody was accounted for. I argued that the information they had must have been incorrect because I heard a lady screaming up there. By this point, the fire had been knocked down and we went back to ventilate and look for a body, but we never found one. We overhauled for two hours, but there was no trace of anyone else in the building and everyone was still accounted for. I still have no idea what happened. One night, Redditor OnlyFigs278 took their dog for a walk. They spotted something familiar in the woods and then froze. This is their story. I was walking my dog outside before putting him to bed at around 11 p.m. It's very dark as there's a lot of wooded areas around my apartment complex. I usually walk him about half a mile or so out from the complex to a stop sign and light post at the end of the street, which borders the woods. Usually there's nothing out of the ordinary, just woods and the normal animals like squirrels and the occasional deer. Sometimes there's that weird heavy feeling like somebody is watching you intently, but I mostly ignored it and we cut our walk short and headed home since a brief scan of the area showed that nothing was there. Tonight, there was that heavy watched feeling again, but when I scanned the woods, there was something there. A dog with glowing yellow eyes. A dog that looked exactly like my dog, down to the heart-shaped white spot on his chest, standing just past the tree line, staring directly at us. It looked like it could have been his identical twin, but there was just something off about it that invoked that feeling of run. My dog definitely saw it too and was whining and staring hard at it. Usually my dog is reactive to other large dogs, but he seemed more scared than anything else and he wanted to get away too, which is very abnormal behavior for him. After seeing it, I fought that run feeling and I walked quickly but casually back into the gated area and home without looking back, but listening very hard for anything coming behind or to the sides of us. Instinctively, it felt like the safest thing to do, but I don't know why. It seemed like it didn't follow, but who knows? I do know that I will be skipping nighttime walks for a while, that's for sure. Any ideas on what that might have been? Google wasn't much help. We live in North Georgia, at the base of the Appalachians, but I didn't grow up here, so I don't really know about the local folklore. Whatever it was, it was definitely creepy. Many people travel to the old citadel in Charleston, South Carolina because they've heard that it's haunted. But what happens to somebody who stays there without knowing about its allegedly haunted history? Redditor Daphne is dumb has an answer. I had a work trip in Charleston, so I booked an embassy suites and the old citadel seemed like a nice property in a convenient location. My fiancé found out that it used to be a Civil War armory or something like that, and he was loving the history aspect of the hotel too. We had a nice southern dinner in one of the most beautiful cities in the country, in our opinion, and when we went back to the hotel, everything seemed fine. We got ready for bed, watched some Netflix, 
planned our next day and turned the lights out to go to bed. My fiancé passed out instantly, and I dozed off, but I felt the weirdest pressure consuming my body. Like I had a ton of bricks on me. I've heard of sleep paralysis before, but I've never had it in my life. I opened my eyes and I saw the darkest looking figure in the corner of our room. I was completely frozen and I couldn't speak. I don't know if I was frozen in fear or if it was something else. I kept staring at the figure to see if it would move and it looked like after a few minutes, it just faded away into the corner that it had been standing in. I was still frozen and once I was able to move, I snuggled up with my fiance and got my phone and looked up the hotel. And that's when I saw that it was named as one of the most haunted hotels in the entire South. After snuggling with my fiance and mostly being under the covers, I fell asleep. I told my fiance what happened the next day and he said that he had had some really dark dreams, which is very strange for him. So something was definitely fishy. We asked the hotel staff at breakfast if the hotel was haunted, and they laughed and said, I'm not going to touch that topic. We had another five days of our stay, and I was so scared to sleep, but it never happened again. Does this seem like a haunting or just sleep paralysis and a weird coincidence that he had scary dreams that same night too? Could it have been anything? I know that city, although beautiful, has a very dark history. I also forgot to mention that this was at like two or three in the morning and the room felt very cold. When I was able to get my phone to do some research, the hotel Wi-Fi, which was typically lightning fast, was painfully slow up to the point where I had to use regular data just to use the internet. And even that was unusually slow for a bit. I remember thinking, Somebody doesn't want me to know whatever I'm about to find out. In a harrowing moment, Reddit user Cherry Cranberries encountered a police officer who saved their life. But was it an officer or an angel? You decide. I was telling this story to someone today. I haven't spoken about this story in many years, but I thought I might share it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was barely 20 years old, living in Massachusetts. I was driving to my college at the time. I commuted to school. And this particular day was very snowy icy and sleeting. I don't know why school was in session, but in the Northeast, they don't take bad weather very seriously. I think we've all seen the memes of cars with piles of snow on them saying that they're heading to work. That's just New England for you. So anyway, I'm driving to school and I was late. The road which I was driving on was a two lane highway that was very steep. Between the two lanes were Jersey barriers, and the opposite flow of traffic was on the other side. Like many roads here, there are no shoulders, and there was no turnaround. Once you were on this highway, you had to drive another five miles before you could pull off to the closest exit. It was the type of highway where if your car stopped, you were pretty much screwed because there was nowhere to pull off. Again, no shoulders or grass, just concrete barriers on both sides and a barrier in the middle. It was a dangerous highway that many people had died on. Even a friend of my mom's coworker had died on it. I was driving pretty fast for the type of weather I was in. I was in the far left lane and could see a tractor trailer in the far right, but behind my car. Suddenly my car fishtailed and I spun out completely. I was suddenly in the far right lane, facing oncoming traffic. The tractor trailer was coming at me, like coming at me. There was no time or place to go. I remember this feeling came over me, like my brain didn't register what was happening. And suddenly out of nowhere, 
My car was in reverse, and I was in a miracle of a small shoulder, but still facing oncoming traffic. I don't know how it happened, and I remember being in shock. Like, how did that just happen? The tractor trailer blew past me in seconds. I mean, I would have been literal toast if I hadn't gotten to that shoulder. Breathing really heavily, I said to myself, did I really just do that? Within what must have been 10 to 15 seconds, I hear a few knocks on my driver's side window. I open the window and a young male police officer is now staring right at me. He says, hey, I saw your car spin out. I see the lights behind now, and his car parked right behind me, in the same small squeeze of a shoulder that we had, which ended quickly up ahead. Clearly seeing me in what probably looked like total shock, he continued and said, uh, you were going too fast. I said, yeah, I, I know. And then he says, in this soft but direct tone, stop rushing. Why are you rushing? You need to relax, okay? Relax. It was something like that. He then says how he's going to stop the traffic so I can turn my car around the proper direction and get back on the road. It's fuzzy how he did it, but I just remember him stopping the flow. I turned my car around out of the shoulder. Remember that my car was facing the wrong direction, so I wouldn't have been able to do that without his intervention and slowly I pulled it back in the proper direction that I was supposed to be going in. I continued on and I looked behind me. Normally, you can see a cop pull out after you, see their lights on or the car themselves if they turn it off or whatever. But all I saw were the cars that were waiting for me to drive. It's weird to explain, but this cop disappeared in seconds. I mean, disappeared. And like I said, there was nowhere for him to go. The only turnaround, that small cutout median that cops tend to use to go in different directions, wasn't for another mile ahead. And the first exit off wasn't for another five miles. The small little shoulder ended up right where I was, and this cop was nowhere to be seen. It was so weird. I remember looking back several times in my mirror and saying out loud, where did he go? It was so odd that I thought about it all day. I came home and told my parents what had happened. Of course, in shock that my car spun out in the opposite direction and I almost hit a tractor trailer, I told them exactly where this took place, how my car went into reverse, how I have no recollection, and of the magical cop that showed up in 10 seconds and disappeared just as fast. My own parents thought that it was the strangest thing. I've told this story to a few people I know, and they've also thought it was weird. I think, and my parents agreed, that either that cop was sent by God at the exact moment I needed help, or he wasn't really a cop at all. It's been a decade, and I still think about this encounter. Without that man, I wouldn't have been able to get back onto the highway unless I had taken a great risk or sat there in confusion and shock with the possibility of someone else hitting me while snow, ice, and sleet fell on my car. It was a very peculiar and life-saving encounter, and whoever it was, I won't soon forget it. Redditor Arctic Fox of the North came to the Ghost Stories subreddit to tell not one, but three ghostly tales. Let's hear what happened. So I've wanted somewhere to share my experiences, and figured here was as good as any. My encounters with ghosts have all been pretty short, so far, so I thought I'd just put them all into one story. To this day, I'm convinced that my workplace is haunted. I had my first encounter while at work one evening. It was a little late and a coworker and I were staying behind to clean up after the others had left for the day, which is something we regularly do. 
I was going about my business and cleaning up, but when we were done and heading back to the sluice, my coworker and best friend noticed that I had a pretty large oil stain in the shape of a handprint on my upper back. At first, I was suspicious of my coworker, thinking that she had placed her hand on my back, but we later compared her hand to the one that was on my clothing, and her hand was way too small. Thinking back on it, I had never felt anybody put their hand on my back while I was working. That and the stain was so visible that if somebody had actually put their hand on my back, they would have needed to keep it there for a while and while I was moving around. I find this pretty freaky. I still have no clue where it came from or how it got there. My second and most recent encounter happened two days ago. The weather was pretty bad and the power ended up going out, halting production. The foreman and assistant foreman told us to go wait in the sluice, but it got a bit crowded, so we eventually shuffled into the cafeteria. My best friend and I were made to go clean up like usual, but since it was almost pitch black, we couldn't see anything, and thus we only finished off with all the machines the best we could. When we got back into the sluice, we both saw somebody standing by the racks where we would usually hang our work clothes, but when we got around the corner and out from behind one of the shoe racks, there was nobody there. We looked into the foreman's office that's attached to the stairwell and looked into the other sluice, which is right beside the one we use, but no one was there. The weirdest part is that we both saw two different ghosts. I saw a short and stubby figure while my best friend saw a tall and lanky one. By far the weirdest experience that I've ever had. But the other one happened a while ago. I was visiting my best friend and we were watching The Conjuring, as you do. She had turned on some candles for some ambiance. Well, while we were watching the movie, one of the candles she lit almost went out, while the other one was standing perfectly still. What I find scary is that the candle only moved whenever something happened on screen. This candle was on a shelf, mind you. I got so creeped out that I eventually just blew out the candle. Something I should note is that my best friend has an attachment, her words, not mine, and now I'm pretty sure something has latched onto me as well. Her house has this old sword that she says has the souls of all of its victims trapped inside, even the original owner of the sword. She's experienced way more spooky things than I have, so I suppose she has more authority on this particular subject. Nevertheless, it's kind of scary, even though she always assures me that the ghosts at her home aren't harmful, but they do like to mess around. Somehow, that's less than comforting. Reddit user Jerry111165 moved into a house 20 years ago. Little did he know, it had one extra occupant. Here's his story. 20 or so years ago, when our three girls were three little girls, two, four, and six, we lived in a house in Massachusetts. We shared a driveway into the woods with a neighbor, a good guy. He told us that before we moved in, a little girl that had lived in her wheelchair had somewhat recently died from leukemia. I couldn't even imagine. Those poor parents. We lived there for seven years. After we had been there a year or two, we started having occurrences late at night, between midnight and 2.30 in the morning. The two older girls shared a bedroom and slept in a bunk bed that I had made. My oldest was in the top bunk. My youngest had her own room. So late at night when the house was dead quiet, the girls' toys would start playing by themselves. Some would light up. Some would make whatever noises the kids' toys do. This started happening a lot, and man, it freaked my wife and me out. 
We'd be sleeping and suddenly the kids' toys would start moving around and playing sounds by themselves. We just knew that it was the little girl who had died from leukemia. She just wanted to play and she did come back and play. Our house was way off the road, very long, dark driveway. No one came out there and especially not at night. One night I was home alone and somebody knocked at the front door. I didn't think anything of it and I ran to answer the door. When I got to the top of the stairs, just a few feet from the door, I stopped. I just knew that there was nobody there. My hair stood up. It really scared me. The toys playing by themselves went on for several months. One night, we woke up to my oldest daughter shrieking. Her bunk bed was tall, so when she was sleeping on her back, it was kind of close to the ceiling. I mean, kind of, you know what I mean. She was screaming bloody murder. I think she was probably around six years old. She had woken up and said that a little girl was floating inches above her head, right up against the ceiling, looking down on her. She just wanted to play. When she was just 11 years old, Reddit user SimpleLeaf96396's dad rebuilt their home. However, brand new as it was, he didn't stop something uninvited from checking out her new bedroom. Here's the story. I grew up as an only child. My parents had my sister when I was 11. Before she was born, my dad rebuilt our bungalow into a huge two-story house. Hence, no one had died in my new bedroom. I'm in my mid-twenties now, but when I was around seven, I started getting a lot of nightmares about the concept of death. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying for weeks on end, and then it would stop for a while before starting up again. By the age of 10, this developed into a feeling of being watched, being unable to sleep, and being convinced that something not someone, but something, was watching me from a specific corner of my room. My new room, the one that my dad had built. My dad eventually ripped that section of wall out to show me that there was a space there. I don't remember why, but there was a space all the way around the upstairs. He had tried to turn it into a fun den area for me, but I hated it, and I wouldn't go in there. This continued until I was about 12, when I got my first smartphone. The iPhone was my dad's old one, but it worked just fine. That was until it got dark outside, and the phone would start typing random letters when I was texting or typing to someone. This only ever happened in my bedroom. As soon as I would go out of the room, it stopped. I told my dad, and he said that it must be damaged and he bought me a new one for my 13th birthday. He believes in ghosts, but he couldn't explain what was happening in that room that he had built. The new phone did the same thing. I thought I was going mad. I bought some spell candles from a witchcraft museum when we went on holiday. I was about 14. I used them to politely ask whoever or whatever was there to please leave the house peacefully. This seemed to work, and I was perfectly okay in that room again. I slept fine, my phones were all fine as I upgraded and got new ones, and I moved out when I was 20. I went to visit my parents and stayed the night in my old room. Whatever was there when I was a child is back. That same corner, that same feeling, the same dark energy, the same creature. Except now, I have an image of it, burned into my memory, despite never actually seeing it. It's a dark creature. It has some type of human shape, but very muscular, and it crawls around on all fours, legs bent behind it. Almost wolfish, but without a snout. 
It snarls and glares, dark red eyes with big black pupils, and it has horns as well. Big horns curved back over its head. There's some type of red tinge to it, but I can't identify where it comes from. But there you go. That's my story. Believe me or don't, it doesn't matter to me. But I don't go into that room anymore when I see my parents. Not even in the daytime. For our next tale, Reddit user that goth witch one recounts the story of a Ouija board session gone wrong. Here's what happened. Roughly eight years ago, during spooky season, I was staying with my boyfriend's mom and her baby daddy at the baby daddy's house. My boyfriend was away in another town, visiting his grandmother and friends. My boyfriend's mom and his two sisters and I were watching a scary movie when we somehow ended up in a conversation about how the house that we were in had a history of being haunted. 15-year-old me absolutely loved the occult and witchcraft, especially Ouija boards at the time. You see where this is going, right? I proposed the idea of making and using one. Stupid idea, I know. And everybody was all up in arms for a spooky October evening. I don't remember what the session consisted of regarding questions or answers, but there's a very good reason for that. About 15 minutes into our session, we get to talking about our creepy experiences. A woman's blood-curdling scream erupted from the downstairs basement, echoing up the stairs to the living room where we were. The baby daddy was asleep, mind you, and even if he hadn't been, there was no way in heck that he could have produced such a terrifying noise. Not a chance. This scream was not a regular scream. It sounded like a few different things. In one way, it sounded like a woman was being brutally stabbed to death and was in excruciating pain. In another way, it almost sounded otherworldly, straight up demonic. It reminded me of what I would imagine a banshee to sound like if I'd ever heard one. We all panicked. All four of us heard it. It sounded so clearly like a physical person, so much so that we were scared that somebody was really down there, so the mom went down to make sure that there wasn't, and there wasn't. We said goodbye and ended the session. To this day, I'm still unsure if it was a lost spirit calling for help, or if it was a dark entity making its presence known. Redditor Daydreaming14 saw her grandma at the mall it was her grandma, right? Here's the story. When I was five years old, I went to the mall with my mom and my sister. When we were walking down some hallway, I noticed a lady in a blue dress with colorful flowers standing next to some mannequins. I said to myself, hey, that's grandma. And I went over to her and we started having a conversation. Obviously, my mom notices that I've run off and goes after me. When she's near me, she says, Who are you talking to? To which I reply, I'm talking to Grandma, of course. Then she replies, Really? So what's Grandma wearing? And I said, A blue dress with colorful flowers. As soon as I said that, my mom grabbed my hand and pulled me away. The thing is, there was no lady with a blue dress and flowers standing there. The thing is that I kept seeing this lady in multiple places with the same dress. Two years later, I was looking at some family pictures and I came across a picture of my grandmother on my father's side. I told my mom, hey, this is the lady in the blue dress I keep seeing. 
My mom explained to me that the lady was my grandmother, yes, but she had passed away a year before I was born, and she had been buried in a blue dress with colorful flowers because it was her favorite dress. So yeah, that's how I met my grandmother, and my mom believes that her spirit is with me because she says that I have the same heart that she had. I care for others, and I love cooking. And my mom says that I get my cooking skills from my grandma. It's been a while since I've physically seen her, but I know she's still there, looking after me in her favorite dress. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. 
My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow, a silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically, and then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the Imam of the village where I lived, the Imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. In this story, a Redditor going by the handle Jupsy Danger tells the short but terrifying tale of something that definitely wasn't Nana. Here's the story. So this past Thanksgiving was hard for my family. It was the first Thanksgiving without my biological grandmother, who I call Nana. Her life partner, who is my other grandmother, we call Nain. So on Thanksgiving, Nain and I and my half-brother were sitting in the living room, just reminiscing on the past Thanksgivings that we had spent with Nana. That was when we heard something fall in the master bedroom. Nain had closed the door to keep the dogs out of there, so nobody and nothing was in there. We brushed it off and decided to put on a movie. We were watching it when we heard voices coming from the room. We paused the movie to listen but we couldn't quite make out what they were saying. 
We assumed it was just the neighbors and weird acoustics, and we were about to continue the movie when we heard a voice call out for Nain in my Nana's voice. Only it wasn't her. We all knew it. Again, she called out, this time for me. This time, the tone in her voice was urgent, like she was hurting. Help me, we heard her cry. My older brother, who's never really encountered for nor cared for the supernatural, was shaking. He started to get up, when suddenly, Nain shouted, something that she's never done. Don't open that door, she shouted. Again, we heard my Nana crying while pounding at the door. It was nearing midnight. When it was 11.52, all went quiet. And that was the time that she had died at the previous year. To this day, we haven't spoken of what happened. Nain made me sage the entire house the next day. And nothing's really happened since. But I doubt any of us will forget that Thanksgiving anytime soon. After the death of their grandfather, Redditor Omastorm had an encounter that startled and comforted them. This is the story. A few years ago, my grandpa had passed away. He wasn't a very big believer in ghosts or anything regarding the paranormal until he was in his older years. Well, I ended up inheriting his 86 T-Bird. Lots of history with that car between myself and my grandpa. Anyway, a few months after he passed away, I'm driving the car to work, listening to music, and just processing the fact that he was truly gone. The car is all I have left, or so I thought. I drive toward one of my work sites, and out of nowhere, I get a blast of the cologne he always wore. It was his favorite cologne to use whenever he was going out anywhere. I pull up to my work site and park the car, I can smell the cologne so strongly in the passenger seat, and I'm just staring at it like, there's no cologne in here, but why does it smell like grandpa's? It took me a solid two minutes to figure out that his spirit was in the car with me. His spirit had taken a ride with me to work that day. The cologne scent didn't dissipate one bit. It was honestly reassuring to me that he was still there in a way, so yeah, interesting and odd encounter for me because of the fact that when he was alive he wasn't really a strong believer in the afterlife well i guess he proved himself wrong because he still hangs around me whenever something's wrong For this next story, Reddit user PrestigiousNeck873 recounts their mom's tale about a rather heartwarming paranormal encounter. Here's her story. My grandma unfortunately passed away around five years ago. She was living here with my grandpa, and they were both on my mom's side. Unfortunately, again yesterday, my grandfather passed. What makes this a ghost story, though, is what happened twice the night before their passing. The night after my grandma passed, my mom had a very vivid dream that she told us about. The dream started with my grandma coming out of her room. My mom was in tears asking her, Mom, are you okay? And grandma reassured her multiple times, Don't worry, don't worry, I'm fine. My mom looks down and notices that my grandma's oxygen tank wasn't plugged in. She wasn't connected to it. My mom had said, Mom, your oxygen. My grandma just looked at her endearingly and said, Oh, I don't need that thing anymore. And then my mom woke up. Fast forwarding to more recently, my grandpa has been very sick. 
He gave up on his health and took very poor care of himself and wouldn't accept any help. He often said that he wanted to die. My mom tried so hard to get him to change his life and go to a hospital, but he wouldn't go or take any medicine. One day, we heard nothing coming from his room. We could usually hear a TV on, him coughing once in a while, but there was just nothing. At that point, he was gone, but we didn't know that yet. That night, she had another dream, but this time with my grandpa. He walked out of his room and made his way to the restroom, and Mom asked, Oh my gosh, are you okay? We hadn't heard from you. He smiled and looked at her and said, Yes, don't worry. We're okay now. My mom described him clearly smiling with tears in his eyes. She woke up the next day, ran into the room, and found him passed away. What makes it crazier is that both dreams happened the night of the day that they passed away, even though my mom hadn't known yet that they were gone. May they rest in peace. In our next story, Redditor Starry Alpha 2099 tells the story of the children they saw in the woods. At least, that's what they appeared to be. Here's the tale. When I was around 12 years old, I was at my cousin's house for a party. I'm pretty sure that it was around Christmas time. We were hanging out in their backyard and woods. Part of their backyard is a wooded area. And we came to this tree that used to have a treehouse in it. All that's left of that treehouse is some steps leading to it, and a few platforms. It's not safe to get up on there, even if you can. My cousin, who was an eight-year-old boy at the time, told us this story about how the kids who had that treehouse had died when it collapsed. I personally thought it was a bunch of BS, but I just went along with it. We eventually headed back to the house, but I decided to go back into the woods alone. As I was walking into the woods, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me, like I was safe there, safer than anywhere else. As I'm walking, I'm looking around and I see a light blue and white checkered flag. It was up in a super thin tree that I hadn't noticed before. As I'm looking at this and trying to figure out how it got there, I started to hear kids' voices, laughing, talking, just having fun. I didn't think too much of it at the time, as my cousins were out in the treehouse, a, a new one that they had built, not the run-down one. As I'm walking closer to the old treehouse, the voices seem louder, and I look back up at the flag. It was billowing, despite there not being any wind. I shook it off as I couldn't feel wind from down there, but figured that maybe up where they were there was a little. And that's when I saw them. Six children with white skin. Like snow white skin. Almost glowing. They all seemed to be wearing winter gear, though dull and dirty looking. They were walking toward me, but I didn't run. I wasn't afraid for some reason. I heard a branch snap and that's when I ran. As I went back toward my cousin's house, I was surprised to see that they weren't outside. I found them in the living room playing video games. When I asked them when they came in, they said, when you were walking in the woods, why? The kids I had heard weren't them. I still don't know to this day who those kids were. They weren't other neighbor kids. None of them lived close to my cousins. Were they just a figment of my imagination? Whoever it is, whatever they were, that incident is one of the reasons that I believe. This story is a fascinating tale from Artistic Rip 8184. 
about a very peculiar patron that entered their restaurant. Here's their story. So this happened a while back, and it still creeps me out. I'm hoping that this counts as a paranormal experience, because it was the most realistic one I've ever had. I've heard that the dead can visit us in human form, but I've always wondered if that's true. I was waiting tables at the restaurant I worked at one afternoon and stopped by to greet a table that had an older woman and a man sitting together. When I spoke to them, the man was looking down, so I didn't notice him right away. The woman ordered her beverage, and I asked the man what he would like to drink. He looked up at me and said, I'll take a Diet Pepsi. All I could do was stare. My dad passed away 26 years prior when I was a kid, but I swear on my life that the man sitting in front of me was the living, breathing version of him. Same face, same height and build, same voice, even the same gold tooth. I don't have a lot of good memories of my dad because he was super abusive to me and my mom. So I had a whole lot of emotions hit me all at once. When I could finally speak, I managed to stammer out, oh, okay, I'll be right back. I took their order and checked on them a couple of times. When they paid, the man smiled at me with this twinkle in his eye that made me feel like it was my dad. He thanked me, but when he did, he didn't say the name listed on the receipt or on my name tag, my given name. Instead, he used my nickname, the name that only family uses, but I had never told either of them that name at all. This story comes to us from Redditor Bowler Beautiful 5804. In it, the author recounts living in an over 100 year old house built on top of a cemetery. Here's the story When I was in university, I lived in an older house that was built beside a church. The house was over 100 years old, but I'm unsure of its actual age. I lived in the basement and had a few housemates. We didn't know at the time that it was built on a cemetery. That was discovered shortly after I moved out. Weird things would happen in the house, but I'm still not sure if it was haunted or just purely coincidental. I would hear footsteps above my room late at night, and when I would ask the next day who was in the kitchen at 2 a.m., my housemates would say that they never came downstairs at all. My one housemate had a cat, and one day we were in the kitchen. The back door opened by itself and the cat walked in. I did see what I believe was a shadow figure in that house. I had a bookshelf beside my bed and had a Buddha statue on one of the top shelves. In the middle of the night, there was a huge bang. And when I woke up, I saw a black figure jump from the bookshelf to the floor and run out of the room. The shelf with the Buddha figure had fallen off the bookshelf and the Buddha had smashed to pieces on the floor. I thought at first maybe it was my housemate's cat that had somehow knocked it off the shelf. But the next morning when I told my housemate what had happened, he said the cat had been locked in their room with them all night. Shortly after that, I moved out. The house was owned by the church and there was a parking lot in the backyard. The church was adding an addition and had started construction and had started digging up the parking lot behind the house. During the construction, human remains were found, which obviously halted the construction until it was determined why the remains were there. It was found that before the house existed, a small cemetery had been on that land. At least 30 skeletons were found, and nobody was sure if they were ever able to determine the identities or why they were buried there. For some reason, when the house was built, it was decided to build on top of the cemetery and the records of the cemetery's existence was either lost or forgotten over time. I'm not sure if the other housemates had experiences there. It was a creepy house and I remember them mentioning hearing things at night 
and not liking to stay there alone. Like I said, I don't know if it was haunted or what, but weird things definitely happened there. Our next story was posted to Reddit by a now-deleted user who tells about living in the most haunted town in Australia. Here's the fascinating story. So for context, the town I used to live in has frequently been referred to as the most haunted town in Australia, and I used to work in a bar on the town's main street, with parts of the building being over 100 years old. This bar, according to the stories, had three ghosts that lived in it, mostly in the old upstairs area which was no longer used as a public space and was just storage. None of these ghosts were at all malicious, but staff staying back late to close such as myself would frequently have sightings and encounters. That being said, the only time I was ever remotely unsettled by an encounter was with that of a young boy who, according to the stories, had died in a fire. In this upstairs storage area was an old photograph of this boy, and to put it simply, he moves in the photo. Now, he never moves while someone is watching, but you would look at the photo, look away for a second, and when you looked back, the boy would be in a completely different position. I saw this happen on several occasions, and the only reason I know that it wasn't just a trick or me going crazy is due to several of the bar's staff members having confirmed seeing the same thing. I don't think it's anything bad, just a little boy playing around, but it really used to weird me out. And honestly, it still kind of does. This story was posted to Reddit by user Werniver Klimt, who tells about a theater with a ghostly reputation. Here's the tale. About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poli Palace. Though it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building. Except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing an iron ladder up about 80 feet. No thank you. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, appealing mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office, with high ceilings and crown molding and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery when two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was also a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. 
I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure, fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences, so I'll start there, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night, while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up to the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the usher had clearly failed to turn off the machines before punching out, and realized that he would have to go do it himself. As soon as he opened the door, though, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of those based on the sources, but here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she, in turn, happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. The woman claimed to be a psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater, and that she felt that somebody had indeed been killed there, and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with a loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression I had. Hello? Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello, I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm, flat, distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All of the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike. Calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise of the line like he couldn't even hear it. Quite audible and clear then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason. But nothing. Mike who? I said, feeling a little bit impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead, silent. The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. Nobody called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they had asked for me personally or just to speak to the manager. 
She said that the caller had asked for me by name. And suddenly, I remembered my mother's friend. A man's name beginning with the letter M. Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises again. No one ever confessed to some kind of a prank. And I never figured out who it was. This story was posted to Reddit by user EveningHoneydew1374, who tells a unique story about walking red shorts. It's creepier than it sounds. Here's the story. I've never considered my childhood home haunted, but I still can't make logical sense of this happening. My friend is the one who actually witnessed the unexplainable in my home. I had a friend over one day, we had just gotten back from an outing and we both needed to use the restroom. My house has two restrooms in it, so we both took one and did our business. These bathrooms are located within close proximity of each other. As I was finishing up my business, I hear my friend calling my name. I yell back saying, what? But she just continues to call for me. I can hear her voice fading as she is moving in the direction opposite of where the restroom that I was in was located. I finished up as quickly as I could to see what she wanted. When I find her, she tells me that she was leaving the restroom when she saw somebody at the end of the hall. She assumed it was me, as I was the only other one in the house other than her at the time. The only weird thing is that who she thought was me was wearing red shorts. I didn't own red shorts. She followed this figure to my brother's room, and when she looked into his room, nobody was there. But the red shorts the figure was wearing were laying on the floor of his room. When she told me this, we got the heck out of Dodge. Ever since that experience, I haven't experienced anything in my home. My friend is a mortician and deals with death on an almost daily basis. She has several unexplained stories ever since starting this job. It makes me wonder if her work with the dead may be related to this experience, as she is the only one who ever witnesses anything, and nothing strange has ever happened since. Redditor Psychological Ant 8611 posted a story that happened to him on a hiking expedition. Here it is. As a young man, I loved to climb mountains. This is an amazing encounter that occurred to me on one climbing expedition. We had left a hut late one night. The intention was to summit a mountain in a single long push by climbing right through the night. It was bad weather in the middle of winter and there was deep snow we were trying to find our way through a maze of crevasses on a glacier. I remember the howling winds and clouds moving rapidly through the sky as the bulk of the mountain loomed over us. There was a full moon, which would hide behind the clouds before emerging again. I remember seeing a man moving up the slope from below us. The first thing that struck me was that he didn't have a headlamp on. I yelled over the wind at my climbing partner, Let's go talk to this guy. What guy? He shouted back. That guy, I said, pointing down at the figure moving toward us. There was a pause. What guy? At this point, I remember losing it. That freaking guy right there. He's right there. And at that point, I looked back down to see absolutely nothing. Thinking he had fallen into a crevasse, we walked down, but we never found any tracks. There was no trace of anyone. In the years since, I have heard reports of similar encounters in that area. In fact, recently, the bones of a deceased climber from the 1970s were discovered, melted out of the ice. The news report reminded me of my mysterious climber from that night, and it just makes me wonder.
Our next story is about a woman who experienced a wild glitch in the Matrix. And she wasn't the only witness. Here's her story. If you don't believe in magic or the supernatural, just go to Africa. The stuff you see there is going to change the whole trajectory of your life and everything you thought you knew. I was born and raised in Australia, but when I was 15, I moved to Kenya for four years with my siblings. I just recently came back. I'm 19 now. I have a lot of glitch in the Matrix stories in Kenya, but this one is the most interesting to me. My older brother and sister and I decided to go to the grocery store after school because my grandma, who we were staying with, wanted eggs. We found this outside marketplace type thing where all the food is on tables on the side of the street. We were picking some eggs until everyone near me started screaming. I got scared and I looked where everyone else was looking. They were looking and screaming at an old lady. She was just standing still. She looked so normal. Nothing was creepy or scary about her. There were a lot of Muslims in the area of Kenya that I lived in, and they were all shouting Islamic phrases at her, some reading the Quran. It was such a scene. Then, as I was watching her, she disappeared. I can swear on all the heavens and gods above that I am not lying. This woman disappeared on the spot just gone. The moment she vanished, everyone started screaming even more. My brother tells me this is all very normal in Kenya, and people believe that women like her are demons, and that's why they were yelling at her to leave. I don't care what it was, but she vanished on the spot. No walking away, nothing to block my view of her, just vanished. My brother and sister saw, the cashier lady at the food place saw, a lot of people saw this. We ran home and told my grandma. And she goes, oh yeah, that's normal here. What? I said. She said that it was people who use black magic to get around and to never interfere with them. I'll never forget what that woman looked like or how my body reacted when I saw her vanish. But along with my other experiences, I know for a fact that the supernatural, magic, and other things exist in our world. Reddit user Between the Cold Wires posted a story about something they witnessed. Blink and you'll miss it. This is the story. My apartment overlooks a big freeway. Through my bathroom and kitchen windows, you can see everything on the freeway. I can't tell you how many times I have seen horrific wrecks that have shook my place. When I want to use the restroom, my toilet is right there by the window, so you always see what's going on. I came across five cop cars, one wrecker, fire trucks, and two cars. The first car was white, and then about eight feet behind it was another car. The wrecker was in front of everything, and it hadn't even dropped the bed or anything. Normally, I just glance over and feel kind of bad about what I'm seeing and move on. But this time, it was different, because it looked like there were a bunch of rescue people on the car, in the back, and there was stuff being pulled out all over the ground. But the cars didn't look wrecked, and normally there aren't that many cop cars unless it's a crime. I can't see that well because I need my glass to see the small details and I was curious what they were doing in that car and what was on the ground. Was it a shooting or something? Another weird thing is that I didn't hear any wreck like I normally do. I didn't hear anything at all. I only noticed that all this commotion was happening when I looked out the window. So I thought, I'm gonna run out to my car and get my glasses, because I use them for driving. As I went down, I also passed my kitchen window, and I saw all the red lights flashing. Just a few seconds to go down the stairs, and a few more seconds to my car, got my glasses, came back up, and in a matter of two minutes, everything out that window was gone. 
There was no evidence of anything, not even debris on the ground. There's no way that one wrecker that didn't even have its bed down to move the two cars was gone that fast. There was no way that all of that stuff was pulled out of the car and somehow put back in completely in two minutes. What the heck just happened? The feeling you get when something like this happens to you is a split second of, did I just lose time? I know I'm not crazy. Did any of this even happen? About 20 years later, I had another experience living by the freeway with some wrecks, but nothing like this. Still crazy though. What happened was I heard a wreck, called it in and they came out. The person was deceased. I watched them clean it all up and then went to bed. 30 minutes later, I heard a wreck, jumped up, looked out my window, and it looked like the exact same wreck. I called that one in too, just in case. I even told them that there was a prior wreck the exact same way on this location. And I started questioning 911, asking if they had properly cleaned up the area. As I watched the second wreck, it was pretty much identical. The person was deceased in the exact same way. In the morning, I checked out the news and what happened was that both cars went the wrong way up the ramp at the same location, hours apart, and both were decapitated in the same spot. The ramp appears to have no problems or indications that would have directed people onto it instead of off. I knew then that something really weird had happened that was unexplainable. What's even more messed up? I just checked our city's active incident reports and it's not on there. I would say to look between 11 and 12 p.m., so I did. I looked at the time and date, and it wasn't on there. There's one freeway report, but it's not even in the area that this happened. So it's like both of these things just don't exist. Redditor Rez on the Radio tells a story about waking up to an alarming situation. Here's the story. So I have a simple story for you. I always go to sleep with my bedroom door unlocked and the key for the door to one side on a shelf. Every time I've ever fallen asleep around people, they've said that I'm most quiet, that I'm almost a dead looking sleeper because I move so little. To my knowledge, I have never sleepwalked. One day, I remember going to sleep as usual, door unlocked, key on the shelf. I woke up to my mom banging on my bedroom door, confused as to why it was locked. I found the key on the shelf and unlocked the door. I tried to explain that I hadn't locked it and I was just as confused as she was. It was very disorienting and I think I probably looked like I was going crazy. It's something that I've wondered about a lot in my life. I don't think I'll ever get an answer as to how I woke up with my door locked from the inside when I was the only one in there. When Reddit user Barkella went to the theater, they got an unexpected show. Here's what they experienced. To preface this story, I've never believed in ghosts or anything paranormal. I still don't. But this is something that I fully cannot explain. This might be a slightly longer story, but I'll do my best to keep it brief. For context, I have worked at a movie theater for around eight years. In late 2017, I received a promotion. I became the manager and I started to close the building at night. In short, besides office work, all that's required to close is to go through each auditorium in the theater and just check to make sure that nobody is still there. The first time anything unexplainable occurred was January 8th of 2018. I was making my rounds as usual, checking each theater to make sure everybody had left. 
When I got to auditorium number nine, one of the last ones I have to check, I began to walk up the walkway toward the seats when I heard voices. I didn't think much of it, but I was slightly annoyed as the last movie playing in that auditorium had ended nearly two hours prior to my check. It isn't incredibly rare for people to have long conversations after their movie has ended, but two hours is a long time. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but I could tell that it was a group of two, a man and a woman. As I approached the end of the walkway and neared the corner to look up at the seats, the couple must have heard my footsteps or keys, because I very clearly heard the man say, hold on. I turned the corner and began to say something about us being closed and them needing to head out. Upon looking up at the seats though, I realized that there was nobody there. I swear by all things holy, I checked behind every seat in the auditorium, behind the screen, absolutely nothing. Besides the entrance to the auditorium where I was walking up, the only other exits are two alarmed emergency doors on either side of the screen that lead outside. No alarms were set off, and I checked to make sure that both were functional. Finally, I checked if, for any reason, there was some audio playing in the auditorium. The projector had completed its closing shutdown an hour and a half before, and I was in the theater. While still having no concrete explanation, I chalked it up to me being tired, and I convinced myself that I was just hearing things. Fast forward to a year later, with nothing strange happening, and the second instance occurred. This night, instead of checking each auditorium on the ground level, I chose instead to look in through the small windows in the booth, the upstairs area containing the projectors. While the view of the auditorium below isn't perfect, the top-down view is still enough to tell if any stragglers are still hanging around. I got to auditorium number nine, and peering in, I noticed a couple holding hands in the middle two seats of the middle row. I could only barely make out the top of the two heads above the seats and their held hands resting on the cup holder, separating them. Again, I was slightly annoyed as the last movie had broken hours prior, but at that point I had drawn no parallels between this night and the previous one a year sooner. Due to there being an employee staircase directly next to my location in the booth, it took me about 45 seconds to get into the auditorium. Walking up, I heard the muffled voices of a man and a woman, and at this point there was a certain degree of deja vu. Sure enough, upon rounding the corner, or nearing it anyway, I heard the man say, hold on. Immediately realizing the similarity, I paused, took a breath, and turned the corner. Nobody was there. I freaked out, checked under every seat behind the screen, both alarm doors were completely fine and not triggered, and furthermore, I knew for a fact that the projector was shut down because I had just been up there. This time, I took it a step further in my search for an answer. I checked every exit camera in the entire theater, and there was nothing. I checked the outdoor cameras that view the exit doors of the auditorium, and again, nothing. Finally, I looked at the assigned seating chart for the last show. It was a Hindi-language Bollywood film that had sold zero tickets that day. Needless to say, nobody was in those seats. I was incredibly uncomfortable, and it only got worse when I realized the date. I kid you not, it was January 8th, 2019. I confirmed the first time was the same date by checking a text conversation that I'd had with a coworker that night, joking about how I was losing it after the first instance. Again, I don't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, but ever since the second instance, I've never checked auditorium number nine on January 8th. I've thought a lot about it since though, and I still have no possible clue as to what might have occurred. None of my fellow managers have ever experienced this, but I've also been the only one working the closing shift on January 8th for the last five years. If anyone has any theories, I'd be more than interested in hearing them. I honestly don't believe that anything paranormal occurred here, 
I can provide any further details that are requested, but not the location for obvious reasons. And just for clarification, when I say I don't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, I'm more so mean in the horror sense. Stuff like horror movie hauntings, throwing chairs, leaving messages in blood, that kind of thing. The Ghost Adventures TV show, for example. The idea of a moment or event being locked in time or souls unable to fully move on for whatever reason is something that I am open to and I have considered here. I know I sound closed-minded, but I don't mean to. It's just the way that I'm trying to process things. And honestly, I still don't have a good explanation. I was camping up in Herber, Arizona with my brothers and my dad. I was 15 or so at the time, and we were deep in the woods, far from most other camps. My brothers and I had our own tent, whilst my dad had a separate one, not far off. He likes to give us our privacy while we're camping. We would usually run around a bit at night before going to bed, entering our camp to sleep at about 11 o'clock p.m. One night, we were playing hide-and-seek when we heard a branch snap a few yards from us. We assumed it was an elk or something, since they were pretty common in our area. We would typically go to our tent if we saw one, in hopes of not agitating it. So that's what we did. I called for my youngest brother, who was still hiding, and he revealed himself to be hiding in a branch pile not super far from where the noise originated. We went to the tent anyway, and I decided that since it was already pretty late, we should just go to sleep. The next morning, I went to check the spot for elk prints, since I found them pretty fascinating. Instead, I found large cat prints, I knew they were cat prints because they had the four toe pads and the large center pad as well as no claw marks. I was honestly kind of excited. I had always wanted to see a mountain lion or a bobcat in the wild, but it never happened. Knowing that I was that close to either one was very thrilling. But it then occurred to me that my youngest brother was hiding, separated from us, scarily close to where those prints were found. It occurred to me that... If it was a hungry mountain lion, and it had taken notice of my six-year-old brother hiding alone, it could have possibly taken the chance. We stopped doing hide-and-seek at night to avoid those types of situations, and we actually set up a roll call system to ensure that everybody was together at night. Now, I know a mountain lion likely wouldn't have done anything had it seen him, but still, the risk felt very real, and I worry that had I not heard it, I could have lost my brother that night. A few years ago, I was camping in the Serengeti as part of a safari I was doing. We had set up our tents in a designated camping area with a bathroom building. I'm from the States and had been camping and backpacking tons of times, but the Serengeti felt different. We could hear baboons from our tents for one. In the middle of the night, I had to pee, so I carefully unzipped my tent and started walking through the grass toward the bathrooms. Already, I was feeling a little jumpy. When I creaked open the bathroom door, a crap ton of bats flew over my head and out of the building. It felt like that scene in Batman Begins where young Bruce Wayne fell into the cave. I was just really hoping that nothing else was in the bathroom. It just felt really eerie. It ended up all right, but I was very glad to get back to my tent. On a separate trip, I was hiking through southern Ethiopia with a guide to a lake where we would be able to take a boat and see some hippos. It was quiet for the most part, but a portion of our hike took us through some brush and trees and we started hearing this loud, gruesome moaning, and the whole forest felt still. We looked and looked to find out what was making the sound, and that's when we saw a massive baboon lying face down on the ground, dying. 
We gathered from its position that it must have fallen from a tree and seriously injured itself, and was now crying out in pain. Obviously, we kept our distance because we didn't know how it would react, or if any other animals would be nearby. The noise it made was both heartbreaking and terrifying. It had an almost spiritual quality to it. We moved on shortly after, but I'll forever remember how I felt watching this animal die alone in the forest. Honestly, it was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. My boys and I were dry camping on a plateau above one of the many canyons in the Snake River wilderness in late summer. The first night at about 1 a.m., we saw several lights rise into the sky which seemed to be about 10 miles away. We immediately thought it was just drones and thought nothing of it. Then we started seeing flashing amber lights reflecting off of the canyon walls. So naturally, my curiosity compelled me to see what was going on. We got in the truck and started driving down the only road in the area, hoping that we could get close enough to see. After about 30 minutes, everything went dark and we never saw any more lights. We never did find out what it was. On the second night, we had just gotten to sleep when I was woken up by wolves howling. At that point, I wasn't scared at all. I was just kind of fascinated by the sounds. They seemed pretty far off and it was cool to listen to. I drifted back to sleep, and then some time later was woken up by the sounds of running animals. I bolted upright just in time to see several animals that looked to be wolves, hard to tell by moonlight through a tent screen though, running right past our truck. They never stopped, just a dead run past us. It's the only time I have ever seen wolves in the wild, and it was intimidating to see just how big they really are. But even with all of that excitement, that wasn't the scariest part of the night. About two hours after the wolf event, I had to get up to pee. I didn't even want to get out of the tent, but my bladder kind of forced the issue. I worked up the courage to get up, slung my gun around my shoulder, and stepped outside. I was about midstream when a thud and the sound of footfalls came from the area just to my right. I spun and drew my other gun in a full panic only to realize that it was a cow rubbing against a small pine tree about 40 yards away. When I tell you I have never been so relieved to see a cow in my life. Other than the lights, the other things were explainable if not still exciting, but I don't think I'm going to forget that trip anytime soon. So I'm stargazing with my wife, and we're both in an extreme state of unease. We both look at each other and we say, something isn't right here. I'm looking into the pines, looking for the reason of our fear, and I see this orange cat sitting on a stump. The way it looked at me scared me, but I didn't really focus much on the cat. Suddenly through the trees, we hear this screaming. Help me, please, anyone out here? It sounded like a little girl at first, but then it sounded like a grown woman. Somebody effing help me. It cut through my body. I have never been that fearful in my entire life. I was completely terrified. My wife yells out, where are you? You're not alone. No reply. We get into our pathfinder, roll the windows down, and we have spotlights out each side searching for this woman. A couple more screams let out into the still night. She sounds like she's within 10 feet, but there's nobody around. We yell out to try to let her know that we're there, but we never get a reply. A scream so loud then happens and it leaves my eardrums ringing. Somebody, please help me. It's like she's screaming directly into the car. 
but no one is anywhere. This scream was different because it sounded fearful, but also angry, and it really genuinely hurt my ears. That was the last one. We kept searching, but not another peep. Her voice was just not natural. I don't even know how to explain it. I am haunted by this experience, and honestly, I'm just looking for answers on what that was. I get chills when I talk about it. It almost makes me teary-eyed. This is probably completely unrelated, but in the same stretch of woods the day before, I was hiking and I came across an owl. I thought it was a decoy, like a prop or something, until it turned its head around and gazed deep into my eyes. I froze. I wasn't exactly fearful, but it had a strange effect on me. Its eyes were orange, bright, almost glowing. We locked eyes for what seemed like minutes, and then it flew off without a sound. I'm a bit mystified by what happened to me. I was out with a friend and the two of us were descending downhill from an old fortress. Just as the sun came down behind the mountain, everything went completely and utterly silent. One minute the birds were singing and chirping like crazy, and the next, dead silence. It was like somebody flipped a switch. You could only hear the wind rustling the dead and falling leaves. It took us a few moments to really notice the silence before the silence almost became loud and noticeable. We kind of looked at each other and stopped to listen for a bit. And after a while, something that sounded like a flute could be heard coming from farther downhill. Every minute or so we'd hear it, five to six second intervals, nothing complex. It lasted maybe 10 minutes and then it suddenly stopped. After a while, we could hear birds and bugs and small animals again, even cars in the distance. But during those minutes we heard the flute, everything went deadly silent. The nearest wolves and bears and things like that are nowhere in this area. And there was just that odd music in the silence. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out what in the world we experienced. My best friend, I'll call her Gray, and I wanted to hang out, so we decided to go for a hike. I chose a reservation that I had been to multiple times before so that we could still have hope of navigating through the long trails in case we got lost. In hindsight, it was a pretty strange decision to go hiking, considering that it was mid-February in New England and it was still pretty cold out. This day in particular was especially foggy and colder than we had expected. We took the bus to the northern entrance of the reservation and headed toward the southern entrance, about a four and a half hour long trail. This was Gray's first time visiting the reservation, so she was attempting to take photos along the way. I say attempting because whenever she took her phone out, she would manage to snap a few photos before her phone would shut off and restart, probably because of the cold. My phone wouldn't even turn on at all. Nearing the end of the trail, we come across an extremely picturesque setting, a large barren tree with a wooden swing attached to the largest branch on the edge of a frozen foggy pond. The first people we see since we arrived was a man swinging a little girl, probably about four years old, wearing a bright pink jacket. We get closer and Gray manages to take a handful of photos before her phone repeats the cycle of death. She tells me that she wants to swing after they leave, so we wait patiently, giving them enough space to not ruin their moment. Not even 10 minutes into waiting, we notice that the man has stopped pushing the little girl and instead is just standing there, 
staring straight at us without any expression on his face. Gray and I turn around to avoid the creepy eye contact for a few seconds. And when we turn back around, the man is coming straight at us on an all-black unicycle. Gray screams, and right before he would crash into us, he makes a sharp turn straight into the woods. I will never forget how creepy this man's face was. He had absolutely no emotion at all, and literally looked pale as a ghost, almost green in the face. We look back at the little girl to see her struggling to run after him, eventually disappearing into the woods as well. Gray and I debated on going after the little girl for a while, but decided not to since neither of our phones were turning on and we still had about a half an hour to reach the southern exit of the reservation. I start pushing Gray on the swing, and as we're trying to dissect what just happened and where this man got a unicycle from, something across the pond catches my attention. I can barely see it through the fog, but quickly realize from the bright pink color that the little girl was watching us from between the trees. What makes us even crazier is that the man and the little girl disappeared into the woods heading east, and the other side of the pond was west of where Gray and I were. This little girl did not have nearly enough time to have gone all the way around without either of us noticing. I pointed out to Gray, and she immediately jumps off the swing, and we both start running to the exit without exchanging a word until we're in the clear. We walked about another 45 minutes until we reached civilization again and found a place to go eat. We go in and Gray plugs her phone into an outlet so that it can turn back on, and we look through all the photos. All the photos from the day are there, except the last four photos that she took of the man and the little girl. In their place were just plain black thumbnails with an error message that read, file not found. To this day, we can't make any sense of that situation. I went back to that reservation several times afterwards. I tried avoiding that pond at all costs. The one time I did revisit the pond area was because of a dare with a group of friends, only to discover something equally as strange. It was about 9 p.m. and completely dark, and there was a group of about 20 to 30 people having a picnic in what looked like colonial era clothing. We kind of creeped on them for a few minutes and decided to just head back before they noticed us. But the fact that they were having a picnic without any sort of lights or lanterns in the middle of the woods was pretty weird. I'm still not really sure what's going on at that pond, but I don't think I'll be going back anytime soon. So, I'm doing this challenge this year where I'm hiking at a new location every week. Yesterday, I was hiking with my friend in East Texas. He has indigenous blood, and so he's very sensitive to spirits. Anyway, we were a mile and a half into this trail, deep in the woods. It's Tuesday, around noon, so this state park is empty. I start seeing shadows of animals, I'm assuming. First, a white furry animal to my left then a large black shadow, about knee height, of what looked like a boar in front of me. I told my friend, and he just said, oh, that's weird. We walk a couple more steps, and he sees a person ahead, but there's no one there. At least I didn't see it. We brush it off, whatever. Maybe our eyes are playing tricks on us, and when he looks again, he can't see the person either. We move on. And then, all of a sudden, the air around us starts to feel super heavy and dark. Both of our chests start feeling tight, and there's pressure in the air. We both started hearing voices of people chattering on the other side of the wall of trees to our left. I was assuming that it was a campsite, because this park has so many campsites everywhere. We turn the corner of the trees, and literally no one is there. No campsite either. 
We both looked at each other and said our own protective prayers and kind of booked it out of there as fast as we could. It felt like we had stepped through a dark curtain or portal of some sort, because when we passed that little river and creek, everything felt lighter. The weight was lifted off our chests, and we had to stop and breathe and kind of reassess what had just happened. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this, but it was definitely odd. I live in upstate New York, and my town has a wooded area that's known to be haunted. We have something in there that all the locals call the werewolf. No one knows what it really is, and bigger animals like wolves and bears don't really live in the area. We just have deer and other smaller animals. But a few of my friends and I have experienced it before, and all our experiences have been practically identical. I don't think it's flesh and blood, but it's huge and darker than dark. As in, when it's pitch black outside, you can still see its outline. My last experience with it was two years ago. It was during the summer, and a friend and I decided to take a walk through the woods. We didn't leave early enough, though, and by the time the sun had set, we still had about a half a mile walk out of the area. The closer we got to the tree line, noises started picking up. First it was twigs breaking behind us. Then it sounded like a huge branch had been ripped off a tree and thrown. My friend and I stopped and turned around and we saw what looked to be a massive black shadow move behind a tree. My friend screamed and took off, so of course I followed. After running down the little embankment to the tree line, we stopped to catch our breath and I turned on my phone flashlight so we could see properly. My friend opened her mouth to say something, but then twigs started snapping around us again. She grabbed my arm, and we both stopped breathing practically, probably out of fear. The snapping twig sounds kept getting closer and closer, so I shined the light into the trees. I saw, dead on, a black mass or shadow move to the right out of the beam of light. And then we heard a low guttural growl just a few feet behind us. We both screamed and started sprinting, finally getting out of the woods. We ran to her car and jumped in, slamming the doors shut, gasping for air. We looked behind us to see if anything had followed, but we didn't see anything, thankfully. That's it, really. But all the stories I know of people who have experienced the werewolf all say practically the same thing. It's a massive shadow that stalks you. You can hear and see it trailing you. It growls and it chases you to the tree line where it then seemingly backs off. Could it be a wolf or a bear? Sure, I guess. But I've lived here my entire life. And in almost three decades, my town has never once sighted a wolf or bear in the area. So, who knows? Not too long ago, maybe four years, I was walking with my family on this trail. We did this often just as a family activity. And this time, we decided to walk along a new trail. After we walked for a bit, my father saw some rubble in the distance and said we should go check it out. We walked up to it and it appeared to be stone buildings, very decayed and barely intact. Just half of one of each walls was standing, enough to tell what the building could have been, but nowhere near an intact structure. But then off in the distance a little bit, I noticed a staircase. The same type of stone, but somehow completely different. This staircase looked as though it hadn't aged at all. 
Completely disregarding this, I stepped on them and I walked up to the top. I looked around and saw nothing else. I told my father to come up, but he said that I should come down. And then I remember feeling this weird feeling. I was filled with dread mingled with a feeling of being lost. I came down and we walked a little bit more before leaving. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned this to my friends and they insisted that we go to check it out. I brought them to the ruins, but they were gone. I know I went to the exact spot, but it was like they never existed. I am a 20-year-old male, and my buddies and I enjoy late-night walks on the trails within the various conservation areas in my region. We live in southwestern Ontario. Late last week, we decided to check out an area called Pleasant Valley. To my knowledge, this area has a deeply rooted history with the Underground Railroad, Indigenous people, as well as the War of 1812. If I'm not mistaken, it's because of its proximity to Lake Erie. At least that's what I've heard. We entered the woods at about 2 a.m. And immediately upon entering, I was overcome with a bad feeling. After walking for some time, the feeling progressively worsened until we reached two bent trees in an X over the path. One of my buddies pointed out the fact that it was, quote, bad juju to go underneath and we should just call it a night. We all felt watched, so we thought it was probably a good idea. As soon as we turn around and start to head back, the entire forest seemed dramatically quieter. We all hear a loud, distinctively human whistle behind us, almost like how you would call a dog over. There's no way that anybody could have been out there at that hour. There's no homes in close enough proximity for someone to just be out and about. We all ran and I was honestly terrified my friends and I are all relatively big guys and we're pretty comfortable in the woods, so it takes a lot to get us running. There was also this faint, unpleasant odor, kind of like rotting eggs as we left the forest, and it wasn't present when we initially entered. I don't know if that's related, but we just noticed it. Either way, weird night. I just got back from a visit to Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. I stayed at the Best Western next to Cemetery Ridge. My room actually looked out onto the ridge. On the first night, I woke up at about five in the morning and I looked out the window at the hill. It was a clear night without a moon, so the hill was completely dark. All I could see was the outline of the ridge. I stared at the ridge and tree line for about two minutes not really knowing what I was looking for, and just thinking about the battle there. For some reason, I started thinking about what if I saw a ghost or an orb, and at that very moment, a bright round white ball of light came in the tree line at the ridge of the hill. It didn't look like a flashlight since it didn't have a beam or variate in any way as it moved. It was about the size of a softball, I imagine, since it was about 150 yards away. It started moving right to left along the tree line and then sped off across the hill toward the angle. If you know that location on Cemetery Ridge, then you'll know what I mean. The whole thing lasted about 30 to 45 seconds. And as it was happening, I wanted to run over and grab my phone to take a picture or a video, but I didn't want to miss anything. I was also trying to figure out what it was. Once it was gone, there was nothing and nobody on the ridge from what I could see. So I got my phone and recorded for about 10 minutes while watching to see if it came back. Unfortunately, nothing appeared and daylight was starting to break. So 
I could actually start making out the trees, and a few statues and monuments on the ridge. Needless to say, I couldn't get back to sleep. I feel like I should also add that the movement of light from right to left was erratic, and when it sped off, it was extremely fast, leaving a trace of light behind it. In my opinion, nobody could have run that fast, and there was no indication of a motorcycle or a bike or a car anywhere nearby. So, I don't know, but it was cool nonetheless. One of my favorite pastimes is walking through and exploring cemeteries. I went to one that I've been to before, but due to its size, multiple trips had to be taken to explore all of it. I came across a grave with no name, no dates, nothing, except for forever in our hearts written on it. I hadn't really seen a grave with no name or date, so I stepped down to take a closer look at it. It was decorated with a pinwheel and a really old dead bouquet of flowers. There were other graves around it with some pinwheels as well. But when I stepped down to look at it, the pinwheel instantly started spinning. I didn't think much of it at first, until I backed off of it and it completely stopped as soon as my foot left. The other pinwheels around the surrounding graves weren't moving at all. It wasn't windy. I thought that it was weird that it stopped. So I went back and forth five times, crouching down to look at it and then stepping off of it. And every single time it would start and then stop whenever I crouched down to look at it and stepped back. It was changing speeds too. It did a slow two loop spin and then started going super fast. It may just be a weird coincidence, but I think otherwise. As I said earlier, I had been to this cemetery before. Every time I go, I always catch weird orbs, and I've gotten multiple apparitions too. So, at the very least, this place is full of energy. So I'm walking to my new job at FedEx, and I didn't realize that I had to walk past a cemetery. Mind you, my shift is from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. I've walked past many cemeteries in my life, so I wasn't too concerned at first. I had a pretty lit up highway on my left, and on my right was a large cemetery. No cars, no people, just me. As I kept walking, I started feeling uneasy about the vibes. It wasn't fear, nor was I scared, but it was dreadfulness and sadness overall. And to make matters worse, I didn't realize that it was 3 a.m. at the time. I tried to look straight ahead and not acknowledge the fact that I had a cemetery six feet away from me, just engulfed in complete darkness, but I couldn't. And I can't explain really what I felt, but it was just awful, like a heavy feeling of sadness, but it felt cold. After walking for 20 straight minutes and realizing I had another 15 to go, I decided to just go back home. As I started walking back, I started hearing the grass rustling as if somebody was following me. Honestly, I think my mind was playing tricks but the whole time I felt like I was being watched. I've had a good amount of paranormal encounters in my life, so I'm familiar with this feeling, but I just felt so afraid at that point. I just wanted to share this experience because it kind of had me distressed and I'm just curious to see if anybody else has had a similar experience.
My name is Josh, and I am 26 years old. I was an only child, and I didn't have very many friends, so I spent a lot of time alone. When I was about 11, I moved in with my grandparents. They lived in a small town, pretty rural, and I spent most of my days, especially on the weekends, outside walking around. There was an old cemetery within walking distance of my grandparents' house, that had graves dating back all the way to the late 1600s in the oldest section. The newest graves were no younger than the late 90s and early 2000s. It was pretty run down since the newest graves, like I said, were in the 90s and 2000s. The oldest section was even more run down. I felt bad that these people were seemingly just forgotten and nobody ever visited them. My grandma owned a flower shop, and she had a bunch of excess flowers, so I asked her if I could take some to put on some of the graves in the cemetery. She agreed, and I took about four bags full and walked to the cemetery. I got there and started walking around, putting flowers on all the graves. I went through the newest section, putting flowers on the graves without incident. I had gotten through about four graves in the oldest section, when something just told me to look up. I looked up and saw a woman, just standing there, directly behind the grave that I had just put flowers on. She was smiling at me, and she seemed to be so happy. I stood face to face with her for about a minute, and then she disappeared. Then I went on putting flowers on the rest of the graves, and I left. I think maybe she was just happy that somebody was coming to visit. I don't know, but it was really special. Last night, I was really bored again and decided that I wanted to see if I would have an experience at the cemetery at night. I waited until midnight and then went. And nothing happened at first. I was just walking. And then my flashlight started to flicker. I went to go hit it to see if it would start working again, and I thought I heard a whisper. I turned around and shined my light on some stone, seeing something go behind it. I started walking to it, and then behind me, I heard a stick being stepped on. I immediately opened my phone and opened an app for a spirit box. I looked at the reviews and people said that it actually worked, so I figured okay. Anyway, I was using the app and nothing was coming through when I previously tested it when I was hearing the voices. Nothing but static. So I decided to go to a really dark area where you can't even see the road. I asked if anybody was there and I thought I heard my name. I got a little bit scared, but I asked again. I said, I need to talk to you. And then I heard laughing like a madman and footsteps running around me. I ran into the light and then nothing but static again. I didn't experience anything after that until I walked to the exit and said, I'm leaving now, goodbye. And I heard a whisper right in my ear say my name. I ran all the way home and I didn't look back. And I don't think I'll go back again. So the other night, my boyfriend, daughter, who's three and a half, and I were walking in the cemetery a few blocks from our house. We drove because we wanted maximum walking time with the toddler. We planned to play Pokemon Go. We entered through the main entrance and after a few steps, I started feeling nauseous and worried, anxious. I didn't know why, so I just ignored it. We wanted to check out the huge headstones toward the middle so we headed that way. We noticed a car parked with its lights off, 
no front license plate, passenger and back doors wide open, and the man is halfway in the back seat. He's parked on one side of the big headstones, which ended up being priests. We walked through and the guy noticed us. He closed the doors that were open, then went around to the driver's side and got in the car. He sat there and just watched us. So we veered away from him and went down a different path. My daughter all of a sudden says, they're so loud. I said, who? My daughter goes, the rocks, they're talking to me. My mouth drops open. We didn't tell her anything about the cemetery or headstones or what the place even is. She has no idea what they are other than big rocks. We ended up leaving, and as soon as we drove away, my nausea eased up. I told my boyfriend about feeling sick, and he freaked out and explained EMF to me. Creepy. We went to the store and passed the cemetery on the way home again. The man's car was still there. He left after we pulled down the street that we lived on. We've had one other paranormal experience with her before. This was the second time that the afterlife, ghosts, spirits, something, showed up to say that it exists, and it's confirmed for me. Later that night, she started talking about the rocks again and said that they were watching us. I asked her what they looked like, and she said, shadows. She said they looked like this, and then proceeded to make a worried expression. She told me that they couldn't walk with us and that they had to stay by the rocks. I don't know if the spirits were warning us about that man or maybe there's just something not so good at that cemetery. But either way, it was a really interesting experience. This happened to me when I was in my teens. For obvious reasons, I won't give my hometown's name, but it's located in Wisconsin. When I was 16, two buddies of mine from high school, we'll call them R and T, told me about a cemetery that didn't have any headstones out by the lake. I'm a nut when it comes to anything creepy or unsettling, so immediately, I was in. They were excited that they had actually convinced me to come with them. I was heavily depressed at the time and kept to myself, so it was rare that I got out. After school got out, R drove us to this supposed cemetery. It was nearing summer break, so it was a warm day. And where I live, warm days mean there are creatures out everywhere. We almost crushed a little turtle family on our way there but we made a detour to pick them up and get them off the road so no one else would. The turtles are okay. This hopefully shows you that there is indeed wildlife out and about in this area. Now, one thing about this cemetery is that it was essentially in the middle of nowhere. There was a small park with nature trails around it, leading to some pretty lovely sitting areas, stuff like that. There was an old Army Reserve training course to the east and farther to the northwest was the mental hospital for the criminally insane. When you first come to this place, there's a boat launch where the ferry used to go back and forth across the lake to the city directly opposite us. The thing is, this place was off the beaten path. You had to go down a marked trail for about 50 feet before taking a sharp right through the underbrush and marshland. When we got there, there was a chain link fence and what I thought at first was an empty soccer field. It was eerie to say the least. R turns to me and his voice takes on a serious tone. Okay, he says. So before we go in there, there's a couple things you should know. One, do not go to the back right corner. And two, if you hear someone talk to you, do not turn around and leave immediately. I really didn't think a whole lot of this warning, 
mostly because R had a penchant for being overly dramatic about a lot of things. So I just agreed. I was eager to get inside the fence and see what this place was all about. As soon as I stepped across the threshold, everything went dead silent. I mean, legitimately everything. No birds sang, no crickets chirped. There weren't even mosquitoes in that place. It really threw me for a loop. My stomach sank immediately, but I didn't want to seem like a chicken. So I didn't say anything. I just looked around. T was a photography student, so he started to take pictures of the trees and everything around us. R followed him for most of the time, while I went off on my own. I was kind of just wandering at this point, but I stopped when my foot sank down farther than expected. At first, I thought I'd just fallen into a critter den or something. I was wrong. Under my foot was a round stone disc covered in lichens and moss. I could barely make out the numbers 103 etched into it. My heart was in my throat and a chill shot down my spine like somebody had dropped an icicle through my skull. I suddenly got that horrible feeling. That kind of feeling when you find yourself somewhere that you don't belong. I was also a stupid teen and curiosity got the better of me. I walked the length of the field, finding more round stones with numbers on them, all worn and weathered from age. I felt sick. When I looked up, I noticed something and I was shocked that I hadn't noticed it before. Across from me, to my right, there was a sort of sitting area with an American flag hanging limply on its mast and a massive boulder with a carved base. I went over to look at it and found an inscription, which did nothing at all to ease my anxiety. It said, quote, This monument is dedicated to the 675 unnamed souls interned here. Amongst their number are doctors, nurses, and patients who were claimed during the epidemic. I don't remember the name of it, as well as Civil War soldiers who fought for the Union. I was freaked. 675? It hit me that this wasn't just an unmarked cemetery. It was full-on mass graves, if the numbered stones were anything to go by. I ran at a full tilt back to where the guys were hanging out, hyperventilating and saying that I wasn't okay to be here anymore. They gave me crap for being a baby, but I told them that I would happily walk home if they were going to be jerks about it. I wasn't comfortable walking across literal pits of bodies. I guess that convinced them because they agreed and we started to walk back the way we came. That's when I heard her voice. Behind us, maybe 15 feet or so, a woman cried out to us. It was the saddest, most desperately lonely sounding voice I have ever heard in my life. It was only a statement, but it froze me stone still. She just said, don't go. I didn't even breathe. R and T didn't turn around, but they did tell me to double time it back to the car. I don't remember running. I do remember the sudden blast of heat from the car door letting out the heat it had collected under the sun. We were gone in record time. The weirdest thing about it though, I couldn't stop crying. I full on sobbed for at least a half an hour after we'd gotten out of there, like the kind of crying you would do at a funeral. I was so sad and I didn't understand why but I couldn't shake it until we parked at a McDonald's and the guys handed me a bottle of water. I asked them if they had heard what I did when I had finally calmed down enough to speak. They said that they did and they were glad I was okay. I don't know who that was. She sounded like the loneliest woman to ever have existed. I could hear the tears in her voice before I even registered what she'd said. I wished I could know her name, but when she was one in 675, the odds were against me. What I do know, however, is that we were the only people in the park when we got there, 
and the only people there when we left. I refuse to ever go back to that place. When I was about seven years old, my mom was at work and my dad was watching me. I was an only child and I didn't have any friends over at the time. I'm pretty sure my dad and I were playing with Barbies when we both heard two children laughing. Nothing malicious, just playful. Then, all of a sudden, we hear a loud thud coming from my bedroom. Naturally, my dad and I went to go check it out. All of the stuffed animals that I had on the bottom bunk were on the floor. I had a bunk bed, but the entire twin mattress wall was filled to the brim with stuffed animals. Every one was on the floor. Nothing could explain how they had fallen, other than perhaps the children we heard laughing seconds before had pushed them off. I had many experiences with the paranormal. We did live close to a funeral home and a cemetery. And this was just one of many things that happened when we lived there, but it's still one of my favorite stories. A few friends of mine were into exploring abandoned places and checking locations out. Whether it's a rundown shack in the middle of nowhere or an abandoned building, we were always eager to take a look around. To be clear, we don't vandalize or destroy property, we just go take a look. One day, I find out that one of the cemeteries in my area is apparently haunted. It borders on an old abandoned mental hospital, and the cemetery was the burial ground for some of the unfortunates who died at that place. The asylum is 150 years old, and it was a horrible place for those who were housed there. All up, there were four of us. After 20 minutes of driving, we get out and search for this cemetery. After about 10 to 15 minutes of looking on maps and walking up and down the neighborhood, we finally came across the cemetery's entrance. It was around 11 p.m. when we got to the cemetery. It was very quiet, barely any cars on the street, and all I could hear was the distant dogs yapping about. All four of us start heading into the cemetery. We're taking this slow and using our eyes and ears to catch anything suspicious. As we're walking, I hear a faint laugh coming from the trees below. It sounded like a child. I first wrote it off as a dog barking in the distance or just something explainable. As we continue down the track farther, I hear the child laughter again. I turn to my friend, who turns to me, and we both just stare at each other. We both heard the same thing coming from the woods below and were just spooked. But that didn't stop us. We pushed on, going farther into the cemetery and toward the trees. We eventually ended up getting too scared and decided to turn around and walk back. I was positioned with another friend of mine, about two meters behind my other buddies. All of a sudden, I can hear heavy footsteps walking toward us to our right. I'm not kidding when I say this. These footsteps just started picking up pace, and we could hear these loud, thumping steps just galloping at us. We panicked like crazy because we were looking directly toward this sound, and nobody was there. It was too loud to be some kind of critter, and it definitely wasn't another person. I'm older now, and I no longer explore urban places or abandoned places. It's too risky, and I don't want to get fined. But I still can't find a logical explanation for whatever it was that we experienced that night. This happened back in 2019, around November 2nd if I remember correctly. 
This story is 100% true. Although, I'm still unsure if it was just a coincidence or what. But anyway, this is what happened. Back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. I wasn't planning on doing anything, I just didn't care as much about my well-being. I stopped wearing a seatbelt. I didn't care if I lived or died. It wasn't that I wanted to do either, I just was apathetic. Due to this depression and things getting worse for me mentally at the time, I did a lot of really dumb things in the supernatural realm. I've always known not to speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious, and I believe in the paranormal and supernatural a thousand percent. Anyway, I live next to a huge cemetery, and I drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighborhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things us humans aren't quite capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery, begging one of the spirits to, shall we say, bring me to their side. This habit started on November 2nd, I believe. So I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. Lo and behold, on November 6th, I was driving to work at about 4.30 in the morning. I go the same way every single day. I was coming up on a red light. Out of nowhere, and I kid you not, this was a literally out of nowhere. I hear this loud honk from behind me, and I was rear-ended by one of those big white rg and &E trucks. You know the ones that fix telephone poles and stuff? Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection. And once again out of nowhere, I was t-boned by some random man in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, and it was completely wrecked. Literally demolished. But I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised. I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. This also happened literally on the main road coming out of my neighborhood, about a mile down from the cemetery. And there are never cars this early in the morning. Maybe one, but even that's rare for the most part. While I was talking to the old man, they live in a town 40 minutes away, and they were driving to the park at 4.30 in the morning? The whole story is so weird, and it honestly kind of creeps me out, especially because one of the things I kept yelling was to get me in a car accident. It was an extremely bad financial situation for me at the time, and I was stuck without a car for quite some time. I think perhaps the cemetery or the spirits within it were maybe giving me what I asked for, but not what I asked for. Maybe they just wanted to wake me up and help me appreciate life again. Or maybe it was just a completely weird coincidence. Take it for what you will, but it was an extremely weird thing. When this Redditor was traveling through Valley Forge National Park, they decided to pull over to capture the gorgeous moon. What happened next was an experience they've not yet forgotten. Here's the story. Sometime last year, we experienced a unique lunar event. I believe it was called the Super Blood Moon, but whatever it was called, it was absolutely enormous. It lit up the sky, was larger than any moon I had ever seen before, and it was beautiful. During this event, I was traveling through Valley Forge National Park at about 9 o'clock at night. Admiring the moon, I decided I wanted to take a picture of it, if I could do so safely. Fortunately, up on my right, I saw a parking area that still had its gate open. I pulled in so as to be safely out of the road, but only so far. I didn't want to go all the way into the lot for some reason. 
I stopped my car, exited the vehicle, and pulled out my phone. Kneeling down, I began to set up for my shot. The moon in view, I lifted my finger to take the photo and stopped. Every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Without warning and seemingly without reason, I felt an intense feeling of dread come over me. I felt as though a crowd of people was pressing in on every side, inching ever closer to me, some close enough to reach out and touch me. I closed my eyes for a moment and then turned around. Nothing. Facing the blackness did nothing to calm my nerves though. In fact, seeing no visible reason for my fear only intensified it. Something in me felt as though I had pinpointed the source. I just couldn't see it. Not wanting to miss my chance to catch a photo of this beautiful moon though, I turned around to face the camera once more. My hands shook, and I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and then I'll be leaving, I promise. After saying this, I felt a slight reprieve in the oppressive feeling, and took two photos. Neither was in focus though, and at that point I was so terrified that all I could think of was leaving. Cutting my losses on the shot, I took my phone and tripod, my two blurry photos, and scrambled to get back into the car. Throwing the car in reverse, I got out of that area as fast as I could. To this day, I have never stopped there again at night, and I don't intend to. Traveling back to Seattle through Olympic National Forest, Redditor Angry111 pulled over to photograph the forest. What they saw as they turned to leave will haunt them for the rest of their lives. This is their story. Last night, I was returning to Seattle after visiting Forks. Along the way, I passed through Olympic National Forest. It was incredibly dark, snowing a ton, and as I was about 50 miles from Forks in the direction of the Ho Rainforest, I was in the darkest part of the forest. Perhaps I should have just driven straight through, but the pines are absolutely gorgeous this time of year, and not one to be deterred from a good nature shot, I decided to pull over. Yes, it was dark, but my phone has a night mode, and I figured this would be as good a time as any to put it to the test. I took some photos and then lowered my phone. As I did, however, I noticed something crouched on a stump. The figure was that of an extremely tall and skinny humanoid figure with long arms that hung down in front of it, too long to be a person's. The thing was stark white and stood out drastically against the backdrop of pines and winter night. What chilled me to the bone though was that it had no eyes. Suffice it to say, I quickly re-entered my car and took off, content to get home in one piece and without having any unnecessary encounters with whatever that thing was. I only saw it for a moment, but if you ask me, it was a moment too long. I can't explain what I saw, and maybe it's better that way. Redditor OK Armadillo 3754 went out on a two-week trip through Washington with his girlfriend. They decided not to plan anything and just see where the trip took them. They got a little bit more of the unplanned than they bargained for. This is their story. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to take a two-week trip to Washington State. One of the main goals of our trip was to plan virtually nothing. We wanted to take off, let adventure guide us, stop when we saw something cool, and go back home when it was time. 
So that's what we did. We started out and just made it up as we went along. It was incredible. First, we visited Yakima, Washington. Then we traveled over to Seattle, wandered through Olympia, explored Bremerton, and eventually made it to Forks. At this point, we decided to go to the Ho Rainforest, which is one of the largest temperate rainforests in the United States. After we'd been there for a while, wandering through in the car, we realized we'd somehow gotten lost. In fact, we were about 20 miles off track, and we ended up in what looked like a tree logging operation. Everywhere we looked, we saw these wide open sections with tree stumps as far as the eye could see. Traveling through this area, the sun began to set. I can't remember exactly what time of day it was when we saw it, but off in the distance, maybe 100 to 125 yards, I saw movement. Whatever it was, it was moving quite fast, and that intrigued me. I slowed down the car and kept my eyes on the figure, trying to see what it was. At first, I thought it was just a bear. Then, as it passed through a cleared area, I realized something that made my hair stand on end. It was running on its hind legs. I watched for about 15 seconds before this thing finally disappeared into the forest. Whatever it was, it was going at least 30 miles per hour on its hind legs, over quite a distance. I have no explanation for what we saw, but whatever it was, it was no bear. While kayaking on Green River, traveling above Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, these friends would encounter a sound they had never heard before, and one they hoped to never hear again. Here's their story. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc., and camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most of the time. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere beautiful. The second day around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide and so deep that the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream, 
that got lower pitched toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient, cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but remarkably, nobody had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large, rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided that this would have to do, as we didn't want to go any farther downriver and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split in two, and, in the middle, formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 or 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all decided it had to have been a falling tree, and we went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So, we packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to go home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the strange things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened at all. No mysterious forest noises, to both my disappointment and relief. When Redditor Dr. Jim Danger and his friends went camping at 18 years old, they met and hung out with a strange old man. It wasn't until two months later that they realized the eccentric man in the woods was far more dangerous than they'd realized. This is their story. When I was about 18, some friends and I took a road trip about seven hours or so down to the Apalachicola National Forest near Tallahassee, Florida. We were going to do a little car camping, drink a few ice cold natty lights, you know, 18 year old stuff, as such, though, we didn't want to be bothered by any park rangers, so we drove way into the woods. We got there, set up camp, had said natty lights, and one of the guys in our group and I decided to do a little exploring. We walked about a hundred yards from our site 
back to the main road and saw another path directly across from us. We started walking. Immediately, we started to see signs that somebody had lived there for a while. Big bags of trash, stuff like that. Should have been a huge red flag to turn around. But, you know, 18. Nothing could hurt us, right? So we get to this campsite of an older white guy living out of his van. Clothesline strung up, coolers placed around it, and a big gorgeous dog. I think maybe a golden retriever. We tried to back out, but he sees us and starts talking. He's friendly enough, asks us where we're from, tells us about some cool spots to check out in the park, and we ended up chatting for 10 minutes or so before going on our way. I kept thinking to myself how odd it was that he gave us directions in steps, not yards or miles. The guy always seemed to be off balance too, not stumbling drunk, but more like he was walking on a balance beam, swaying side to side. The other thing that seemed a little odd was how absolutely enthusiastic he was when talking about the national parks and forests where we were from. I mean, super excited. But whatever, right? We shook it off. The camping part was over and we went back to our tents. The rest of the trip went well and we didn't think about it again. Until two months later. The same buddy that I'd met that guy with calls me really late at night, wakes me up, tells me to turn on the TV to the news. I oblige. I see an old dude with a van. You see where this is headed, but I didn't. So I got pretty pissed at my friend for waking me up. I was about to hang up when he said, No, watch! And then... I see the golden retriever, and it all clicks. What the heck? The news report was about a murder. A few, actually. That man's name was Gary Michael Hilton, convicted of at least four murders. He kidnapped and murdered a girl on Blood Mountain, Georgia, an older couple in North Carolina, and a girl in the Apalachicola literally at the campsite that we had spoken to him on, not that long after we left. And yes, all of the places where he had victims were the very same places he had been so enthusiastically talking to us about. Obviously, we call the cops. They put us in touch with the Florida Bureau of Investigation, and we get flown down to take investigators to the campsite. We pointed out every spot where we'd seen anything, told them exactly what he told us, and showed them the places he described to us. I didn't find out until after the trial, but apparently they found what appeared to be partially destroyed human finger bones in an area near the site. We even had to fly down to testify. To this day, it's the craziest thing I've ever experienced, and I'd be more than happy if it stayed that way. This happened in Fresno County, November 2015, around 3 o'clock in the morning. I am a medic on an ALS unit, and I was working my normal 1900 shift. I was dispatched to a Code 3 cardiac arrest for a side hanging at around 3 o'clock. The call info only had that the patient was a 34-year-old male hanging and the sheriff and PD were on scene. The location was in the more desolate farm properties in the valley. No street lights, just dark, cold, and engulfed in dense fog during the winter. Rolling up, I see a man dressed head to toe in black. Black shoes, black pants, black long sleeve shirt, black beanie, I mean everything. He was in handcuffs, sitting on his hands, with two officers surrounding him, a female, and two very young kids by the house's front door. There was a broken rope noose on the ground underneath this oddly large, wicked-looking gray skeleton of a tree. The man had a small laceration and a rope burn on his neck, 
but he was very much alive. When looking at him, his eyes had little of the white and were black. He was quiet until I sat him on the ambulance gurney. The man was sobbing, trembling and screaming that he can't take it anymore. As I was putting on our leather restraints on his wrists, I noticed that he had deep horizontal cutting scars along both of his wrists. He was only trembling now as if he was scared. All I could feel was cold. This man was clearly struggling and decided that night he would give up and end it all, leaving his wife or girlfriend and two children behind. So far, just a sad story, right? Well, this is where it gets freaky. I have never seen anything like this or heard of an experience like this ever before. Three years later, it still gives me the chills every time I think about it. On the way to the hospital, a few good miles down the road, we made a wrong turn, got a little lost and took a back road. He was quiet and trembling. He wasn't fighting the restraints. He almost seemed to feel safer in the back of the ambulance. While I concluded assessing, I got this bone cold shiver down my spine. I looked out the window and saw this house. Mind you, there are acres between every single house out here. Well, this house was like the others. It looked normal, but next to it was this big tree or bush. And in a separate tone and position was this old four door sedan parked. The car looked out of place and was clearly separated from the house and the tree and bush. It was like the car was its own place. It was really odd and creepy. I can normally see into the car's cab and see the headrest of the driver's seat from afar, but this car was pitch black on the inside, almost as if the darkness was coming out of the windows because it was the deepest and darkest black I've ever seen. All I saw inside was this deep black and two neon dark blue eyes staring back at me, a little above where a tall and very large man's eyes would be in a car. Immediately I felt the back of the ambulance get colder and there were goosebumps on my skin. At first I thought it was a security light or a reflection in the car. But as we passed the house, the car turned on, pulled out, and started following us in the ambulance. The neon blue eyes were still there and the cab was still as dark as ever. The car followed us miles to the highway, still with those eyes staring and the deepest, darkest black in the cab. Even with all the street lights, I could not see into the car. I was almost mystified by this and nearly forgot about my patient. All I knew was that I did not feel welcomed by these dark blue neon eyes. It was almost threatening and felt as if it wanted my patient. We were on the highway and this car was still following us over 20 miles now. The neon dark eyes were still there and I still couldn't see into the car. It got colder. I started to feel as if it noticed to be watching and was watching and focusing on me now instead of my patient. The car then sped up and pulled up next to the ambulance in the next lane while we were driving and looked directly at me. I was very literally five feet from this car and I could see nothing through the windows. All I could see were those eyes. But they weren't looking ahead. They were looking directly at me. In that moment, I said quietly, but out loud, go away. You are not touching this man. This man is my patient. And if you want him, you'll have to come through me. I'm stronger than you and I will not let you have him. After I said that, not even a moment later, the car and my ambulance split off as one went onto one off ramp and the other, I don't know where it went. It was no longer cold in the ambulance and my patient was no longer gray in the cheeks. 
but now his cheeks were pink and normal. It wasn't until after the call and when we got the patient inside the hospital when I realized what had just happened. I truly feel that whatever those deep neon blue eyes belonged to was not human and that it wanted that man. I've never believed in the paranormal or demons or spirits or anything that wasn't hardcore science until this. I haven't had an encounter like that again, and I hope I never do. I don't know if that man is still alive or what his outcome was, but all I know is what I experienced and saw that night. And it was horrifying. Back when I was a captain in the fire department, we responded to a house fire early in the morning. When we arrived, the roof was breached and flames had taken out two windows on the second floor of a split level home. We made entry and even though the roof was breached, the thermocline was about two feet off the first floor. We wouldn't have gone in at all, but a child was missing and the father and mother had gotten out of the house, but they couldn't get to their daughter's room. The father was being treated for burns on his hands and forearms as he had tried to go in after her. Suffice to say, they were frantic. They told us that her room was on the second floor, second door to the right. Simple enough. We made entry and the stairs faced the door. Rapid bursts from the TFT to the ceiling brought the smoke level up to about four feet from the floor. That's when my handline man and I saw something that neither of us could explain. I saw motion to my left, down on the main floor. Somebody was walking around downstairs. I pointed to my handline man and he saw it too. We couldn't see a body as the person was in the smoke, but we could see the legs and the feet clearly. It looked to be a man wearing olive green trousers and leather shoes. I wouldn't say that the legs were dancing, but they were certainly moving in a way to get our attention. We redirect back down the stairs and see the legs go into a door on the right side of the small hallway. We both saw the legs go into that room. We get down the hallway and the door is closed. Feeling the door, there weren't flames behind it, so we made entry to discover that we were in a bathroom. The light was on and curled up in the bathtub was the little girl. There was no one else in the room with her. We broke out the window and got her to a second crew, keeping the house next door from catching on fire. We looked around the bathroom again and couldn't find the man that we had both seen going into the bathroom. There was nowhere for him to hide in there. We withdrew from the house and did exposure control as the house was a complete loss with the fire already ingressing into the living room. The parents had gone with their daughter to the hospital where she was checked and cleared to go later that morning. The man had suffered only first and small second degree burns on his hands and forearms. The family stopped by the station and wanted to thank us for saving their daughter. They asked us how we knew to check the first floor bathroom. And I asked them if they knew anything about a man in olive green trousers and leather shoes. The man pulled out his phone after a minute of thinking and showed us a picture of two old men standing on a lawn. One of the men was clearly wearing olive green trousers and those same leather shoes. The man that we had seen on the first floor had passed away in 1976 and it was the man's father. The little girl's grandfather had showed us where she was. We were all speechless. It's the only time that I've ever seen a ghost during a response, but I will never forget it. One night shift, I was dispatched to the VA clinic. As it turned out, 
a juvenile was in a psychiatric appointment for hearing voices. The kid reportedly heard a pair of hatchets tell him to cut people, so of course, the mom brought him to a doctor. During the appointment, the mother grabbed the hatchets from a bag to show the psychiatrist. As soon as she put them in view, the kid grabbed them and ran out of the building and directly into the cemetery across the street. Thankfully, I was not asked to run alongside K-9 to track this kid, but they did find him without any major incidents. I was, however, tasked with bringing the kid to the centers for evaluation, and while he was in the back of my patrol car, we distracted him with questions while another officer very subtly placed the hatchets in my trunk. It was quiet for a while on the way, and all of a sudden the kid said, Sir, you have my hatchets in the trunk, don't you? I can feel them. I didn't verbally respond, but I simply laughed a little. I have never been so freaked out by anything to this day. The centers obviously wouldn't take the hatchets. My sergeant told me not to place them into evidence, and I tried to return them to the mother and she refused to take them. I think we ultimately threw them out, but I don't really know. I just hope they never reunite with that kid ever again. I was an EMT and then a paramedic for eight years before becoming a registered nurse. It was a decent sized city, 100,000 plus citizens, and loads of weird history. I had a lot of things happen, but this is the story that I will never forget. There was one house that we would go to pretty regularly that was beyond haunted. I don't know who or what, lived and died in there before the then present patient. There were mannequins in the living room, several. I never asked because I didn't want to be in there any longer than necessary. The first time we were called there, I stood on the stoop trying to will my body to go in. The atmosphere in there was intimidating. It almost felt like the house was saying, come in if you dare. My partner was male, so I thought, meh, we'll be fine. I'm a five foot four female, and I can hold my own in a bar fight. Threatening presences I cannot see are another story. We get to our patient, and as I'm hooking up the EKG, someone backed into me, knocking me off the balls of my feet. I was squatting next to the couch. I tell my partner to back up, and he says, from what? I look up and he's on the other side of the room, nowhere near me or the couch. So I turn around. There's nothing there, but I'm eyeballing these mannequins up against the wall, a good 15 to 20 feet away. I shake it off and go back to what I'm doing, and again I'm knocked over. I tell my partner to knock it off, but now he isn't even in the room. He wandered to the kitchen to gather the patient's medications. Now I'm on my feet. There's no way that this happened twice from nothing. I turn back to these mannequins again. One has shifted slightly away from the wall, now standing with a shoulder to it, when before its back was against it. I asked the patient a bit too late if anyone else was in the home. Scene safety should have been first, but yeah, oops. She said no, it was just her and the cat. Thinking this cat must be a puma or something, I start to look for it. Unfortunately, Peanut was no bigger than my American size 7 foot. I had only ventured to the hallway, maybe 10 feet from the couch, but out of view of the mannequins. When I walked back into the living room, that mannequin was now facing me. Every hair on my body stood up. Not today, Satan. We packaged her up got her in the truck for transport, and got away from that tiny house. Lo and behold, dispatch sends a request to my tablet for an explanation of a long scene time. I had to put 
harassed by mannequins in a run ticket without looking like I needed to be on a 72 hour hold. We went back to that house three more times that month. I called from the door for her to come to me. I'm not that stupid. I will never go in there again unless I absolutely have to. I worked as a paramedic on an ambulance during the night shift. One morning, we received a medical call for a patient who was having difficulty breathing. Upon arrival, we entered the patient's home, which was one of the smallest homes I have ever seen. It was about 400 square feet total. You walked into the living room, which connects to a kitchen and then connects to the only bedroom. When we walked in, we saw the patient in the back of the room. During our assessment of her, the cops that were with us kept asking if somebody else was in the house because they said they thought they heard something. With the patient's size and the condition of the front porch, we decided to go out of the sliding door inside the patient's room. After getting the patient into the ambulance, I went back inside the home while the police left for another call after helping lift the patient. I was going in the back room to get our bags and turn off the lights, but when I entered the home, the lights were off. They had all been on just moments before, and it's not like the snow was bad enough to take down power lines in that amount of time. We checked later and no power had gone out anywhere else. I tried the lights to no avail. I thought it was weird, but I didn't think much of it. Then I was walking in the kitchen when I looked down to find our bags all piled up and zipped up. I then felt that there was something in the house. I grabbed the bags and ran out. I found out right after getting outside that my radio had died. It was fully charged when I walked in there. I had thought that the cops put the bags in the kitchen, but they were outside the home before us to help the patient. I was the last one out of that house and our bags were opened up all the way because we had to get the patient various items from each bag. I have no explanation for how our bags got packed up and zipped up. And to this day, nobody is taking credit.